Good evening. Can you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. This is the uh, Hampton Board of Selectmen for March 11th, 2019. Public comment period. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is David Gaithel. I live on 23 Ridgeview Terrace, it's a little dead end street off of Mace Road here in Hampton. Uh, I wanted to talk to the board tonight and by extension the people in town about the road races and the traffic flow. Uh, specifically, the, the situation has become intolerable um, and, and unsafe. Uh, for those of you who do not know, I am a commercial fisherman. My life revolves around the tide, not the clock. Um, we need access to the piers and our vessels. Closing the roads, even for relatively short periods of time, is not an option. Uh, during the recent race, in uh, early March, I needed access to the state pier. An officer was nice enough to let me through, but many others were turned away. While pumping salt water at the state pier, we heard a huge crash on the Hampton River Bridge. Uh, one car went right underneath uh, another car and nearly pushed the first car uh, through the guardrail on the western side. And it was traffic headed north that was stopped. Uh, at least one more car piled into them. Uh, there may have been another one, but I couldn't see that far. Um, emergency responders had a difficulty reaching them through the runners and the stalled traffic. Um, last year's race, our fish co-op, which is in Seabrook, uh, could not be accessed for over uh, four hours uh, when they had the race that went across the bridge, turned around at River Street and came back across the bridge. Our employees could not get to work. Our trucks could not leave to pick up or deliver fish and no customers could reach our fish market during what is usually a very busy time for us. Uh, I have talked to a number of business owners and residents both uptown and on the beach who are upset, but a lot of people frankly are afraid to come in and say anything because they feel the races are sanctioned by the town and endorsed by the precinct and they don't want to be on the bad side of anybody. I on the other hand don't have that problem. Uh, and I always like to do more than complain so I would try to offer a solution that you can think about before the next race. Uh, if the town approves more races, uh, runners should run up the left-hand lane of Ocean Boulevard and down the left-hand lane of Ashworth Ave. Traffic could use the right-hand lane on both roads. Uh, that way the racers wouldn't have to cross the traffic or the traffic wouldn't have to cross the racers. Um, no racers should ever go across the Hampton Bridge. The bridge is inherently dangerous to begin with and it is our means of egress in an emergency. And you know, if that bridge is closed and something happens, uh, this could be a real problem. And I believe the races, the people who sponsor these things should be responsible for providing uh, delineation with orange cones, uh, signage, and security. Uh, if races are allowed into uptown Hampton, the course should be delineated along the edge of the larger boulevards like High Street and Winnicott Road. Streets like Mace Road and Mill Road are simply too dangerous for cars and runners to pass each other. If uh, race committees cannot agree to these terms, then no permit should be issued. Uh, I look forward to the board taking a more forceful stand on future races. It is a matter of both quality of life for residents and public safety for residents of Hampton. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dave. Does anybody have any questions or anything? Usually during public comment, we don't. It's it's just you coming in making a comment and then okay, it's taken up later good. by us. Thank don't. you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Preston. Well, um, just one quick one. I don't think we come up with the uh, recycling. I was going to ask the question if cardboard has any value to it to the to whoever's the recycling person. I don't know who it is. I would have asked him. And if it does, what constitutes, you know, the value of as far as how clean it has to be, whether it is tape or staples or whatever, because Hampton Beach produces a lot of cardboard, so I didn't know if that's a viable option. 
something to consider. I know the town of Seabrook next door, they, they bail everything. They bail plastic, tin, cans, uh, paper, aluminum, whatever. They, they bail everything over there, cardboard, and they weigh it and they sell it. And um, I didn't know what the recycling's going on. And let us know if there's any value to anything that comes off that beach. Thank you. All right. Anybody else from the public who would like to speak? I agree with him about the races. So, <laughs> uh, my name is Tracy Kelly. I live in Hampton, and uh, I wanted to thank Regina Barnes and Tom Sherman for being such great public servants that they responded to questions that uh, I had and some other people in the community. And uh, I had the opportunity to talk to John Burns, who I went to one kind of high school with, and I'm very happy that he's here to present. Uh, his great organization to the town. Um, you know, I think it's very important, you know, that the town officials are transparent with people in the community about issues with drug, addic uh, drug addiction. And there are a lot of people that don't know really how Hampton is impacted. So I think transparency is very important. Um, just being <coughs> honest with people uh, because citizens do want to help their fellow citizens. And I think you'll get more engagement by letting people know really what's going on in the town. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public would like to speak? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for announcements and community calendar. Mary Louise. Please vote tomorrow, mm. 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. I'll second that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'll be there. Um, also, I wanted to say I got a notice from the town manager today that Aquarian Environmental Champion Awards are coming up in May, and that's a uh, very nice event. I'm glad to see, and they're going to have it at the Victoria Inn again. That's on May 9th. So if anyone in town knows of any nominations they take uh, for a pers uh, person, a nonprofit, or a business. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Jim. Vote tomorrow. Yeah. Rick. We're looking, every looking forward to seeing everyone at the polls. Alrighty. Next thing we have is approval of minutes. Mr. Chairman, I will be happy to approve, move the approval of the minutes of February 25, 2019, the public session and the non-public session. Second. I have one minor correction okay. on the uh, public session. Um, it's on the second pay, uh, page. If you look at our notes, it says page five of eight. But, um, I had asked the uh, deputy um, public works director at the time uh, about where the um, paving and stuff was going to be on High Street, if there was any, and it was said that she said it was going to be from the parking lot west to Route One, and that wasn't in here. And I just want to make sure that, that is added oh, in okay. here. So, so I, is there a so you want to change that to? I'll um, make a motion. Oh, no, I'll make the motion that we change that. Mine stands. Well, just I, I will move uh, with the correction okay, stated you. by Chairman Bridal on page five of the minutes. Second. 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 All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Next, we have consent agenda. We have a parade and public gathering license. We have a proclamation for the Rotary. We have a recreation advisory council appointments of Eric and Michelle Kulberg. We have a uh, RSA 4114A modified modification to a deed restriction, use of town property, the Hampton Garden Club, using the town office parking lot. <coughs> we have a, re, re, a petition to form appurtenances to existing polls by Verizon. We have a request with a letter of no objection of 438 Lafayette Road, and we have a private stormwater system connection agreement at 47 Falcon Circle. I'll move the agenda. Consent agenda. Okay. I'll second, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, and note that the number seven request for letter of no objection, Harps Variety, uh, the gentleman was in before the planning board last week, and the planning board approved his uh, request. All righty. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Next is appointments. Mike Dufour, a Northeast Resource <laughs> Recovery Association. <coughs> 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 
Yeah. All right. I want to thank uh, Fred for inviting me to uh, come and speak. Um, we've been doing a lot of these presentations as more and more people are paying attention to what's happening with recycling. Um, and I don't know how much time you have. Normally this presentation lasts about four hours. Um, <laughs> there'll be an intermission. <laughs> Mark. Could, could, could I ask, Mr. Chairman, because the public at home wants to hear you too. Okay. Would you mind just sitting down and with the microphone? Okay. I know you're being polite. But, um, we really want to hear you. Could I get mic'd up? Yeah, just get a little. <laughs> we, I don't, we don't. I don't think so. <laughs> he had one before, but that's all right. I, I just hate to sit with my back. Because what you're saying is important. If they'll. Well, well, well you are going to get mic'd up. I was <laughs> ask and ye shall receive. <laughs> well, we had this on the plan. If this doesn't work, but I, I tend to talk with my hands and move, and um, it would throw me off my game entirely. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, and I, I do have about an hour's worth of material. I'm going to try and condense it down a little bit. Um, so we appreciate that. That much time. <laughs> um, but it is an important subject. By way of introduction, uh, briefly, uh, my name is Mike Durfor. I serve as the executive director for the Northeast Resource Recovery Association which is the oldest collaborative recycling organization in the country, started here in New Hampshire back in 1981. And we're coming up on our 38th um, conference in uh, Manchester in May. The, the whole idea behind this was getting towns uh, to work together cooperatively so they could get better pricing for material. And we'll get to Seabrook in a little bit. Um, if you had one bale of cardboard in one town and one in the next town and on and on, you have four bales of cardboard, but each one of those costs you to get it to market. It's not a full truck load. If you put all four on the truck, then there's no charge for the hauling, plus you get paid for a full load of material. It was a win-win for everybody. There were very four small towns, uh, Peterborough, Gilmantine Works, and two others that participated back then. But over the course of the 38 years, a lot has changed in the recycling yeah. business. And uh, part of our theme last year was recycling still rules. Uh, or rules, rather, I should say, and then this year it's still rules, and you've got um, the uh, rulers that you have provided are actually uh, magnifying glasses so you can find the recycling money in your budgets when you go to look at it. <laughs> um, I do want to uh, talk but into three different parts. One is the global impact that's uh, taken place over the last two and a half years. It's had such a dramatic impact on our national recycling, and then bring it down to the local level and see what looks ahead. Um, and questions at any time are fine because I won't remember and maybe you won't remember either when we get to the end of it. This was uh, first brought to light uh, <coughs> a national sword program that China instituted. And it instituted back in April and July of 17. This October 19th uh, slide comes from a national conversation, the national conference call. There were over 500 recycling professionals on that call. They had so many they had to turn the rest away. And that told me that this is going to be a big deal. When you've got that many people that stop in their day and take, it was actually a two hour webinar uh, call type of thing that they did. And you had people waiting to get online. Then this is something that's going to be very important. And it certainly turned out that way. This is from uh, Dylan de Thomas of the Recycling Partnership, and he took the time to paint the Great Wall of China green because that's what they instituted was the green fence. This was back in 2013. So this wasn't something that just happened you know, in the last year or so, even though that's where we're seeing the impact. This has been in the works for a long time. Mm -hmm. And when they instituted green fence back in 13, they said, these materials appear to us to be contaminated and we don't really want contaminated material, and we really don't want to pay you for contaminated material when you're supposed to be bringing us clean material. And that was the, the start of this uh, movement that we saw in China. This is a ship in uh, Long Beach, California, and you can see the containers that are on that ship. And in this particular case, you can understand why China could be so competitive. For every boatload of flat screen TVs they sent us, that ship going back to get more was empty. That container ship was empty, and all those containers were empty. So they could actually ship that material back to China for less money than it took to, to transport it from one side of Los Angeles to the port. 
And that gave them an extreme competitive advantage, which they then translated into paying more for material than anybody else in the marketplace. They were paying things like $300 a ton for cardboard. Cardboard today is at $60 a ton. Its normal range runs from $60 to $120 a ton. But right now it's at about $60 because the domestic markets can set that price as so much of an extreme supply now that things aren't going to China. But at that time, that's what they were doing. And I want to go back, I think. This button's a little, yeah. So they started after Green Fence, they instituted an Earth Goddess, which meant that we're going to inspect every load of material that comes into us. We don't want to take the first two loads off of the, out of the container are OK, and then the rest of it, you've got actual garbage bags of trash. Mm. That somebody figured, well, that's, I can get paid for this. I don't have to pay to throw it away. What a deal. They, they got very serious. In terms of the, um, the current China sword, however, like Green Fence in 13, it stemmed, it stemmed from a national scandal. And I don't encourage you to go online, but you can actually see Plastic China, which details a family with children basically living on top of plastic. You get up in the morning, you start with sorting plastic, you go to bed, you get up in the morning, you're sorting plastic again. That's, that's your livelihood. And it, it's, the urban legend is that the president of China, Xi Jinping, was embarrassed by it. And he was also concerned about it. So he took the, the time to uh, have a speech in April of 17. It had 89 mentions of the environment, the word environment, and only 70 of the economy. Their economy had been reported at about a 13% GDP, which we think was overstated, but it was still high. It's now down around 3, five, three to 5 and they were um, looking at that as a way to um, mitigate a little bit the concern that their new middle class had come into. They didn't want to have a problem with those folks. So they instituted a scrap ban, uh, 24 different uh, kinds of scrap and most importantly mixed paper and plastics that they were not going to take anymore. And they notified the World Trade Organization and official correspondence. It wasn't just a rumor or anything like that. Um, and they also made it very public in China. They had over 85,000 tons were confiscated in a sword raid that were not appropriate, didn't pass anybody's contamination metric. This one is the one that I think is most telling. If you look at <coughs> China, 60% of the groundwater is unfit, excuse me, 60% of the groundwater is unfit for human consumption. Almost 20% of the land is so contaminated with heavy metals they can't farm it. And only 84 out of 338 cities can go outside without a mask. And down below, you see a lack of enforcement of existing environmental laws, lack of centralized control, and at the very bottom, 100 million new cars on the road in the last 10 years. That's a huge explosion of not only cars, but the atmosphere uh, issues that they bring with them. Mm -hmm. But just it changes the whole culture of the people that are working in that yeah. system. But the biggest problem that I, I settled on was the rising social pressure and pollution-related events, um, social incidences, rather, leading cause of uh, social instability. Mm. They're afraid that their middle class that they've created is going to revolt. That's my own opinion. I haven't got anything else to back it on except, yeah, if you've got that many people and they're all not happy, maybe they will. And you can see stories now where the folks that have been doing manufacturing in China are moving back out to the countryside because they don't want to live in that kind of environment. Uh -huh. So things definitely change, are changing within China and they want to maintain control. This is a typical um, processing facility, if you will. Uh, this, is, this is one of the better ones, if, if you will. Uh, but you can see that there's not a lot of OSHA requirements going on there. Uh, this is CRT glass processing. This is leaded glass. Lead is an, uh, inherently toxic to the human uh, existence and can cause all kinds of health issues. You don't even see any mass on these kids here. So the, it, regardless of why they did it, what's, what does it matter to us in the United States? It matters because they were taking and absorbing, because of their economy, more material than anybody else in yeah. the marketplace. I'm sorry about the buttons. There we go. So in this one, you can see that over 50% of the recovered paper and fiber was being consumed by China. 
This is the world supply. This isn't just the American supply. It's the world supply. They didn't just uh, pick us out uh, special. They, uh, they made this ban across the board. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to do a couple of things. One is they wanted to respond to the environmental pressures they were having. They wanted to make sure that they built their own infrastructure and, and policed and recycled their own materials. And they didn't want to deal with anybody else's garbage. That was the, the primary driving force. You can see that they were becoming more self-sufficient as they grew their own uh, internal uh, recycling capacities. And they shut off the EU along with us. They cut their, uh, their fiber intake by over half. So 50% of the material that was bailed and at the dock and ready to go to China couldn't go anywhere. They didn't have an outlet for it. In the United States, what had happened, you know, wait, don't get to plastic too quick. In the United States, what had happened with fibers is back about six or seven years ago, the um, influx of Chinese buying of material had driven out a number of local mills, probably about a half a dozen to almost a dozen New England mills had shut down. They couldn't compete with that price point. Now what we're seeing is China's coming back into the marketplace and they're buying those mills for pennies uh -huh. on the dollar. And then they're going to ship the material back through those mills into China because they've got import licenses. So they're in for the long haul and they have a plan and this is how they're going to operate and it's having a huge impact, not just in the United States, certainly. Along with China happening, we finally came to um, recognize the issue of plastic. And I'll show you a chart in a little bit. And all of this, I think, Fred, you can put on the website when you're done, too. So if I miss something or whatever, you feel free to call. But in terms of plastic, it, it goes back to uh, the graduate. Any of you remember the graduate? Mm -hmm. yeah. Plastics, young man, plastic. Boy, did we make plastic. Dustin Hoffman would be really proud of us, right? Yeah. We've got a chart that shows plastic going off the roof in terms of billions of tons produced. But only right now, I think we're looking at about a 4% recycling rate of all of that plastic. So if we're not recycling it, and we're not capturing it to put it in a landfill, it's ending up in the environment. And that's why you see so many of these articles here, what we're seeing, the recycling is broken, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050, yeah. which is not that far away. It's, it's a real problem, but the packaging people have managed to say, well, we're going to create a product that we can put more yogurt cups on a Walmart semi-truck than we ever could before. So we're being green because we're shipping more product, but we're using fewer tr trucks to do it because of the weight. So it was all a weighting issue in terms of how they could uh, economize in terms of their shipping costs. Mm -hmm. Here's a look at plastics that we exported from a billion tons of pounds, rather, up to six billion. Yeah. So we kept shipping it. We kept shipping it. Um, I think there was an article just yesterday that said uh, both India and Thailand have said, we can't take anymore. Yeah. Because when China stopped taking it, it had to go somewhere. People had, they scrambled to find a home for it. Mm -hmm. And what they found was Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia. Malaysia, I think, is one of the ones here. Um, but they, they just got overrun by the volume that China was taking. We're the largest uh, scrap exporter by far. And you can go through all the numbers and look at those. But you'll see the United States is a huge exporter of plastic because we use so much plastic. <coughs> Along with the China. And along with plastic, we had the growth of single stream. That started in, the, in New England about 2002. I think the first uh, physical plant was up in Chittenden County mm. and, uh, in Vermont. And then there, are, there currently are facilities in, in Rutland, Vermont. And then Eco Maine has one. There's one in Charlestown, Mass. And there's one in Bill Ricca, And there's a couple more in Massachusetts. And then you have to go out west to <coughs> the next, next level. But single stream was confusing because it was different in every town. Every town had a different, we'll take this, we won't take that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Leave that in the, if you think it can be recycled, put it in the bin. And that was fine as long as you had that margin for error that said all of this, whether we think it can be recycled or not, we're going to ship it to China and they'll buy it. So yeah. there wasn't a problem because the costs were covered. What we found because of that, and especially with some of the pay-as-you-throw programs around, 
It's going to cost you to put it in this bucket. It doesn't cost you to put it over here. It doesn't take a whole lot of science and math to figure out this is the one you want to put everything in if you think it can be recycled. And I, I can tell you I've seen presentations by waste management, um, and this is one that says the combination, uh, contamination rather, can be up to 50% of all the incoming material. And they initially, the single stream facilities were paying for material. Then as their costs began to creep in, and as China stopped paying on the other end, they got upside down. So they had to start charging. And some of the articles you'll see they're charging now as high as, I think it's $170 a ton in, in Philadelphia. This was the most recent number. So they blamed it on single stream because we encourage people to put everything in one bucket. When you put it all in one bucket, then it can get contaminated. And certainly glass is one of the ones that, that the single stream facilities didn't get engineered enough for because glass, when you put it in your, in your toter at the end of your driveway, and they dump it into the truck, and then they compress it because it's a packer truck. Packer trucks pack really well. But with two pieces of glass next to each other, you're going to end up with chips. Then you go to a transfer station, dump it on a floor to load it into a 100-yard trailer. Ching, 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 ching. And then it goes down to Charlestown or one of the other facilities and gets unloaded onto the floor and it breaks again. You basically contaminated the entire load. Prior to this, China didn't care. They would take that material. They would take the cardboard. They would take the mixed paper. They would take the plastics. When they stopped taking it, the domestic mill said, wait a minute, we can't deal with that because if that glass comes through our mill, I'm going to lose $300,000 just on one section of my line making new paper. So the domestic mills that were left in business wouldn't take the, the material that was coming out of the single stream plants. And the typical uh, plant would be set up for something like a 7 to 10 percent contamination rate. China said you can come in at a 0 .005 contamination rate. There's no way they could do that. The, the plants just weren't engineered for it. They didn't anticipate it. This was um, one from, I think, 2015, uh, recycling's broken and it's going to die and all this kind of good stuff. Um, it was a nationwide crisis starting back there in 15 that nobody really paid too much attention to other than, well, that's just John off talking in the New York Times. But in fact, what you saw it, in addition to the plastic in China and single stream and glass is you had a, a real reduction in the amount of actual newspapers. Clean newspaper is what we call number eight news is uh, worth today probably $75 a ton. It's really good stuff. But if you mix it in with a bunch of other things that mess it up, like plastic, not so much. But this is the volumes that drop. From 2000, we're at 15 million metric tons. And by 14, it's down to five. And by now, you're looking at USA Today, and it may have four pages. Instead of four sections with four pages each, you probably have about four pages left in the newspaper. British Vancouver estimates that in another five years there won't be any newspapers in the province of Vancouver. Uh -huh. okay. They've got a dual stream set up going. Hmm. So if uh, China shuts the door or the plumbing gets stopped up, what are you left with? You're left with mixed paper. What are we supposed to do with it? Well, you, they want it dry, so you've got to put a tarp on it because you haven't got any room to ship it. This particular uh, facility is down in Massachusetts, and in addition to these bales, there must have been 30 tractor trailer loads full of material that they had no market to take it to without paying for it. And one of the articles that said that uh, mixed paper was the one that was especially hit hard is it was paying $100, and now it's dropped to uh, only paying $3. It actually swung further, and you had to pay $65 to get rid of it. So you were getting 100, and now you're charged 65 on half of the volume going through your facility. You're really upside down. And you can't survive very long with that kind of cash flow that's just going down the tank. Larger is better. We believe that uh, more large regional hub and spoke MERS would come online. Uh, this was earlier on, and some of them did, but not enough up here in New England. This is an absolute uh, spotless uh, facility that I think was not even open yet. If you go down to one of these facilities now, it looks a, a lot different. But here's the, uh, the dramatic growth in single stream plants up until 16. And the ones that were built between 12 and 16 were all basing their economic model on what was the revenue coming in in 2011. 
That was the most recent fiscal year they had. And 2011 had to be the best year ever for recycling because the markets were paying $300 for cardboard. They were paying uh, 85 to to $100 for mixed paper. They were paying almost a dollar a pound for aluminum cans. Everybody was saying, okay, we should build a single stream plant because we can take all that money. We'll make $180 a ton for the conglomerate ton that we sell out the back door to the markets, and our processing fee is only 100 That leaves us with an $80 profit, and we'll give half to the town, and we'll keep half. The town was getting paid $40 a ton for the material. That didn't last too long. By the time we got into 17, I think the, the average was, it went something like, we'll pay you 25, there'll be a zero floor, then it went to 35, then it went to 70, and within a week it went to 95. And like I say, now it's up to anywhere from 125 to 140 to 170, depending upon which facility you're talking to. So the cost of that material has gone up. Is it a recycling issue? No, it's an economic issue, because the markets are driving those prices. You've got to cover your cost. You have to add more staff to sort it, because you've got to have less contamination. You've got more, con more contamination than you've ever had before, so you're having to pay to put that in a landfill or a burn plant. So your costs are going up, your staff is going up, you've slowed down the line of your processing facility to try and meet that spec, which you can never meet because you've never been engineered for it. Mm. So it it's, not a, it's not a pretty picture when it comes to pricing of that material. This one shows when that other, uh, let me see if I can go back, there we go. Okay, so we're building more and more plants. The problem is the value of what we're building to take in was dropping. And it wasn't recognized because if you think about a permitting process, which you all have to deal with, it takes you a while to get permitted, it takes you a while to get funded, then it takes you a while to build it. So you got about a four year build out of it. So from 2012 to 16, everybody's building single stream plants across the country to take this material in thinking that it was going to be a, a godsend for them and they'd make a lot of money. In fact, the value of that material was dropping at that time. Mm -hmm. And we hoped that there was a little bump in the middle there, but actually it turned out that it just fell like a rock when we got in there. So January of 18, you know, I think it was probably about $30 a ton charge, and now it's up to 140 depending on where it is. This is Ben Harvey of E.L. Harvey down in Westboro. This is some more of the mixed paper, similar to what you saw before outside. And uh, Ben and his family have been in the recycling business for over 100 years. Ooh. All of the Harvey family have worked in this business. They have a campus, if you will, for recycling down there in Westboro. It's been phenomenal because they started before there was single stream. They have a C&D facility. They have a cardboard facility. They have one for aluminum cans. They have a data destruction facility. They've got just about anything. Matter of fact, it goes back to their roots. The last time I was down there, we were driving around, and there was a can in the corner of just about every turn that had something in it waiting to be recycled. They didn't have a market for it yet, but they knew they didn't want to throw it away. Because they had come back from World War II. You don't throw anything away, because it's valuable. But his, uh, he ended up building a single stream facility, and he, he got caught in that same way we talked about. He's not sure how much longer he can keep that open. So they had to figure out if you are going to stay open and you're in the hole, what do you do? And some people raise taxes. Other folks that are in the business say, I've got to charge you more so I can at least break even. There were a number of companies that went to towns, uh, specifically down in Massachusetts, and said, look, I know we have a contract, but I can't do this. I'd be glad to work with you. I'm trying to make this work for all of us, but there's no way I can put a man in a truck or put 76 people on a sort line and make this come out given the economics that we're facing with this Chinese thing. This is, this is a once in a lifetime type of thing. This isn't something that is going to go away. So the choice that the town has when they're dealing with a hauler is saying, well, we have a contract. We're going to enforce the contract. Okay, well, I don't have any money and I can't pay them and I'll see you in court and meanwhile, who's going to pick it up? That's the real dilemma. You're between a rock and a hard place. And it's not one that anybody isn't being transparent about, because it's definitely happening. These are the most uh, U.S. plastic scrap export. When China put it in place, we were dealing 75,000 tons a month. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got to the end of the year, we were down to 5,000 tons a month. And you can imagine the 
backup of that pressure from the material. This is uh, out at the port in Los Angeles, the same type of thing on the West Coast, where more of their material went directly to China. Some of the East Coast material went to China, but some also went over to Turkey. Um, this is what you're seeing all the time. Washington State and Oregon State both had bans on recycling, being any recycling material being put into a landfill. Both of the state agencies, like our New Hampshire DES, had to issue waivers to haulers and said, we'd rather have you put it in the landfill than put it in the ditch on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. If you can't find a place for it, then, okay, just for this interim while we're under this crisis, we'll have to start with that and then see what we can do. And in that case, they would end up paying $65 a ton to dump it in a landfill or in a burn plant. Not the preferred method, obviously. This indicates market growth in uh, Southeast Asia. Like I said, when China first did that, a lot of the companies went over to China and said, can we help you with your recycling program because we want you to keep taking it. But barring that, let me go down and see if maybe India, uh, maybe Vietnam, maybe Malaysia could take it. It lasted about three months and they were full. Ooh. The volume from China, that 55% of all the recyclables in the world going into China, they just overran all of the other countries combined. They didn't have the capacity in place. Nor did the U.S. have any domestic capacity in place because China had put them out of business. So looking ahead and what's next, there's going to be more environmental uh, compliance inspections from China. We've seen more this year. Uh, we've seen that the markets have not rebounded. Some people say, well, this will just pass like it did back in 2013 and 15 with the green fence. It's not going to pass. This is a game changer that's going to stay in place. And it's going to be something we're going to have to deal with. There's a potential ban on additional paper, certainly on plastics and on metals as well. This was before the bans were put in place from China, but annually $6.5 billion of valuable material, a product that could be sent to market that ends up in a landfill. If you want to find a couple of billion dollars, it's sitting right there. So we've got all this going on with recycling, and then we get into the next phase of this wonderful discussion. How do we talk trash? because this is what's going to happen with the trash market in the next couple of years, and it's not pretty. So we have this perfect storm going on. This is from Massachusetts, and they just closed two major landfills in Massachusetts, Southbridge and Chicopee Falls. Each of those accounted for about 400,000 tons of trash a year. So if you close them, just like China closed the recycling, where's it going to go? Some of it's going to come to New Hampshire. Waste management and turnkey are, are right now, I think, in the process. They've got an approval on their permit application for expansion. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that right now, some of it is going to Virginia. After it gets ba bailed up, bagged up, and put on a truck and shipped out of Massachusetts to Virginia, mm -hmm. to Pennsylvania, and to Ohio. Oh. And that is going to last about so long before it's going to be just like Malaysia and the Philippines and South Vietnam taking some material from China, that's going to get full. And for those towns that don't have a real choice, I think in one of the articles on Franklin, the other one's on Hooksit, they're looking at their single stream re recycling and they can take it to the Pentecook burn plant for $68 or they take it to a processor for $140 and their budget was built on $35, they don't have a choice. So whatever recycling they were doing, if they were at 30% on a curbside single stream program, they're now at zero. Unless you count you know, the burn plant type of thing. But some of that material will probably have to end up in the landfill because the burn plant can only take so much material. And to add insult to injury, next year the contract with the Pentecook incinerator is up. So their power contract is up, which funds most of their, a uh, good portion of their uh, operation. So if their funding drops from the electrical uh, contract, they're going to have to raise the price of their tip fee. And as more and more material hits the New Hampshire market, whether it be from Massachusetts or somewhere else, those landfills are going to fill up faster. If they fill up faster, the cost is going to go up quicker because it's supply and demand. So right now, if you're looking at $140 in, in single stream recycling tip fee, if you will, 
or anticipate you might get there. The real kicker is, what's my MSW the number going to be? Because if the MSW number <coughs> you currently have doubled, Fred over here would be crawling into the corner in his budget. <laughs> it's not a good number. You get, you get trash up to $100 to $160 a ton, like the recycling. Recycling is going to start to look good again, but your trash number is going to kill you. You're going to have to choose between paying your trash bill and hiring a teacher or a policeman. That's where it's going to come down to. Hmm. This is just the tip fees. The top line is the Northeast. We're the most expensive um, tip fees in the country because we have the least amount of available land that is a, uh, acceptable as the landfill, if you will. Mm. Not in my backyard. But, uh, uh, there's certainly more uh, favorable pricing for tip fees down in Florida. We just presented down there on glass. But for up here, it's pushing $80 already plus uh, transport. But the good news is that uh, this is a famous quote that I'm not sure is actually accurate, but we'd like it anyway. Uh, crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other opportunity. But danger is we don't recognize what's going on and we don't do anything. <laughs> because sooner or later, the Titanic hits the iceberg. Spoiler alert. It's, we've seen this movie. We know how it's going to end. It's going to be higher prices for credit. No question. <coughs> This is a timeline of where it came from, just so you could understand that it wasn't um, something that just happened overnight. I'm probably going to lose. I'll go this way. The August 1st issue of Life magazine in 1955 offered a two-page article on throwaway living. Consumers are progressively sold on the idea that single-use items are a necessity of the modern lifestyle to free up uh, the folks to have a better experience and Ease and convenience become the two most desirable qualities in product marketing, inevitably leading to parks, forests, and highways becoming littered with garbage. We were sold on the convenience factor. If it's convenient, if it's cheap, if we can just let somebody else worry about it, we, we don't care where it goes, it's not on us. <coughs> Another crisis that happened, and you may or may not remember, this was the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. Everybody, Republicans and Democrats, could figure out rivers aren't supposed to be on fire. They're for canoeing, they're for fishing, they're for swimming. They're, they're not supposed to be on fire. And the next year, the EPA started. So we actually took some positive action to help correct it. We recognized the issue and helped correct it. And today, the Cuyahoga is not like that, fortunately. We also knew we had a litter problem from 55 throwing up single use or what have you, let's throw it out the truck and just make it a national litter problem. So our friend on the left, who looks like a Native American but is actually a Native Sicilian, um, was the poster child for Keep America Beautiful litter campaign. And in New Hampshire, New Hampshire the Beautiful has been fighting that bottle bill for years and making the case that even where they have bottle bills, they have a higher litter problem than we have in New Hampshire. So they've invested a ton of money in helping towns with their litter problem, as, as well as their recycling problem, as well as the school education program. Some of you may remember the barge to nowhere, the Mobro. It went, uh, I think, 6,000 miles with 3,000 tons of garbage on it, and finally ended up right where it started. Had to go to an incinerator first. This was out of New York City, and I think today is something like 93 Mobros a day are going out of the city with the volume of material. Those uh, tons, by the way, are going to those same places in Virginia and in uh, Pennsylvania and in Ohio. So you're competing with those tons with the other tons out of New England. The other part I forgot about in terms of Massachusetts, by t another 2025, they will be short about 2 million tons total. 2 million tons that don't have a home. We convinced everybody to recycle. If it had this little symbol on it, you could do it. And technically and scientifically, we have the capability to do that, but there wasn't, there no longer a market for it in today's market because China doesn't take it anymore, especially if it's contaminated. So the message that we've gotten from all of the studies that we've done and been part of is you got to clean up your, your stream. No glass, no grocery bags. Pretty soon, I think there's one vendor already said no bags of any kind. Um, 
before you know it, you're going to be down to ones and two plastics, cardboard, and aluminum cans. Wow. And you'll be doing that sort before you put it in that one bucket at the end of the road. The rest of the material will end up in the trash bucket. If that happens, the trash bucket's going to end up in the landfill. If that happens, the landfills are going to fill up. Yeah. Hello, we're going to be paying a lot more for trash. So clean up the bales, communicate with customers. We talked about slowing down the line, hire more workers. All of those add costs. Ugh. All of those drive up costs. The National Swana um, Organization, which deals mostly with the solid waste industry in North America, has committed to trying to educate people. We have to change what we're doing. Whether it's what we buy or how we use it or anything else, we've got to change it because the market's not going to change. My, my buddy Johnny Carson, this actually we put in uh, two years ago. Um, beyond that, major unforeseen events could totally undermine the stability of the recycling industry. We didn't have any crystal ball at that time. We didn't know China was going to do that. We knew they were working on specs that were going to change. But to actually shut off all that material worldwide really reflects on the fact that their economy was really in a downturn, more so than they were letting anybody know. What we do every uh, month at our office in Epsom is we have members around the table trying to figure out what's the best way to approach this, what's the best way to, to move cardboard, to move plastics, um, to move Freon out of refrigerant, uh, tires, you name it, scrap metal, all, all of the things that happen at a transfer station or in the single stream facility uh, or, or a town is what we try and work with. You can't see this, but that's good because the that's pricing right. changes. Uh, this is just a list of all the materials, and actually I had a few left over I put out there. They just show you the value of the material. The, the uh, bottles here are worth 20 cents a pound. If you have a full load of them at 40,000 pounds, you can do the math. That's valuable material. They're worth more when the price of gas goes up because that, the virgin oil costs more, so then they start to look for more recycled material when the gas is down then the virgin oil is, is pure and they know exactly what the viscosity is going to be, so they shy away from this. So the market continual flows back and forth with the price of gas. But this is just an example of the, of the number of items, and this isn't everything, this is just a range of items uh, that we deal with at, at the uh, organization. But one of the things I'm most proud of is the, the work that the school club has done because that's where our next help is going to come from. We may all have a good idea um, sitting in the room tonight, but I can guarantee you that there's a fourth grader out there somewhere that's got a better one. And that's where I, I pin my hopes in terms of the people that are going to make a difference and make a change. Um, this is an ugly picture of me on the left. And just in my town of Sunapee actually had uh, total revenues of 31000 and cost avoidance of another ten. So we had $41,000 that we either took in from selling recyclables and or avoided from not putting it in the in the uh, landfill, and I got to commend Scott Hazleton. He's working on a new composting program, which should take about 30% of the volume out of that waste stream. When it does, it'll save the town even more money. This is our uh, 38th annual conference, and uh, I think it's the 10th annual school conference we had. We're shooting for over 200 teachers and school kids there. We're your best defense against national sword. I think Gwen found this one for you. <laughs> <coughs> this was good, but I was doing this presentation up at Dartmouth-Hitchcock last, last summer, and I'll just focus on the first one. Um, right when I came out of that presentation, I said, the, tar the current tariff war had nothing to do with what we're doing here. This wasn't about the tariffs. This is totally separate. This was against Europe and everybody else as well. But while I was making that presentation, China went and put a 25% tariff on cardboard. They didn't even tell me. I could have changed the slide right in mid-presentation. It would have worked fine. But things happened so quickly. That, that three-day period, as you can see, there was a drop in the market for cardboard with the tariff. I think scrap metal dropped. The electronics manufacturer had a 5% surcharge because the plastics had dropped. I just stopped answering my phone on the weekend. <laughs> Monday morning, we came back in, and we moved two loads of cardboard. We moved a, a load of tires. And Freon was extracted, and I think there was electronics as well. So we just keep plugging away and doing what we can to, to make it better. Wow. Here's another reason why it's going to work. This kid has uh, been in the business now for about nine years. Mm -hmm. started out when he was three with his dad. And he just did a TED talk on recycling to 20,000 people in the state. 
and his fondest wish right now, his goal, is to get his first garbage truck. And he said, don't worry, Dad's going to drive it until I get my license. That kid is going to come up with an idea that's going to help, that's going to work. Just like this one. This kid is only, he's now 23. He was uh, 18 when we started following him. His name is Boylan Slatt, and some of you may have seen him on 60 Minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, we saw him when he first started, and he too did a TED Talk and said he was scuba diving with his buddy, and the guy, buddy was making all kinds of noise and pointing at all the fish in Greece where they were scuba diving. Unfortunately, the fish were plastic. Oh. And that's when he decided, I've got to do something. So he designed this boom system that he's taken out to the north of Hawaii. And uh, unfortunately, you can see on the bottom how long that is. He suffered a setback already because the boom broke. But starting at 18 until now 23, he's raised $300 million. Mm -hmm. And he's going to suck the plastic that's in that out of the ocean mm -hmm. and then reprocess it. And I think he's already got a, a deal with Hoover Vacuum Cleaner to make it into a new vacuum. It's not, going to, it's not going to solve the problem of the plastic bag in the Marianas Trench, but it'll help show that you can actually mine it. Because at some point in time, we're not going to be 7 billion people here. We're going to be 9 billion. We're going to need more resources, not less. And that'll become very economical when it gets there. We try and encourage recycling of all materials. And I want to thank you for recycling and take any questions. And I probably ran over my time. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. That's very informative. Any questions from the public? Sure, go ahead. I just have one. With the, uh, as these plastics degrade, they become nanoplastics and microplastics. Mm -hmm. They're taken up into fish tissue. Yep. Um, we didn't yep. talk a whole lot about that, but the uh, issue of how, at what level we are all connected I don't know how long it takes to get clean of it. I know that when you wash a vest made out of plastic, the fibers, I know my wife sent uh, the folks a, uh, a note. It was, I can't name the company, but it was about the nanoplastics in toothpaste. And she said, I really don't like the fact you're putting plastic in toothpaste, and I put that in my mouth. And they said, don't worry, we're working on that. Here's two coupons for more toothpaste. <laughs> So it's going to take a while until it becomes such a crisis that we have to deal with that. And part of that that I'm convinced, in, especially up here, is the, the economic impact of this is going to drive people to look at things better. Someone, one of the articles said we need a fourth R, and that is refuse. Don't buy anything that's going to do that type of thing to you. And eventually we won't. There are some stores that are starting that are package free. There's a company in, in England that uh, they deliver your groceries. They'll wait while you unpackage everything, and they'll take the packaging away. Mm. It doesn't do away with the fact that we created the packaging in the first place. Um, but again, it's 10, 15 years. The light bulb is going to have to go on. Because when you, when you have things like you know, more plastic than fish in the ocean, and the fish that are in the ocean have plastic in them, mm. this, is, this is not hard to understand. It, it is a crisis in terms of the environment. There's no question about that. It's also a crisis in terms of the pocketbook. So we've got two issues equally important. It's just not going to get fixed overnight. Mm. I wish I had better news for that part of it. I will tell you that the efforts that we're making, in, especially in the terms of composting, uh, we're working with schools, uh, fortunately funded by a USDA grant, to try and introduce schools to do composting in their schools. So they could actually do, I saw one up in Chittenden, Vermont, about three or four years ago. The kids run the whole program. They collect all the food scraps, they make the compost, they plant the vegetables, and they put the vegetables back in the cafeteria. That closed loop kind of thinking is what we're going to have to do to survive. But that's what we'll get down to. Yes, ma'am? Why do certain uh, stores have uh, collection baskets for uh, plastic bags? And Stores. Why do they? Yes. Um, I think they want to make it convenient for their um, customers to bring them back, to have a place to bring it back. Oh, okay. And one of the things that um, actually is in the legislature right now, it talks about bans on plastic bags. Mm. But the, um, that particular structure 
is working really well because as much clean plastic as you can put into that system, you end up making Trex decking out of it. So it's a reuse. Mm -hmm. It's not thrown away. It's not going to a burn plant to burn you know, toxins that you have to scrub for, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But the, the plastic bag is a very visible um, symbol, if you will. But, but they can do that, but the town can't? Is that what you're trying to say? No, um, I, I'll tell you that having talked to Trex, they want the material that comes out of the grocery store because it's typically cleaner. If you had the same clean process here in town or a, a, a box up front or something like that, they'd be happy to do that. It's got to be dry and it's got to be clean. So typically when you deal with transfer stations, it's anything but dry and clean unless okay. you've invested in the infrastructure to do that. Thank you. Mm. Just to clarify, though, when we're talking about the shopping bags that they have the recyclable in front of the grocery store, the main reason we don't want those in our recycling is because they're gumming up the manufacturers that are doing single stream. And it's causing our trash to be contaminated and therefore not be recyclable. So if they get them out of the stream and they become their own, are they themselves still recyclable? Oh yeah. The, the okay, so that it's, that's why it's important to keep them separate and not put them in a recycling stream. Absolutely. The, the way the star wheels were developed, and it's usually the first line on every single stream facility, um, the 12 or so that I've been to, I think, um, I saw a picture where they had four people with sheetrock knives trying to cut them off of that star wheel system because if once they gum it up, the things don't go through like they're supposed to. The cardboard gets contaminated, mm -hmm. and then it's onto the glass piece, which is also a problem. But as long as they go into the Trex program, they're getting made into new material. And that's good. I keep them out of the standard. Yes, sir. Yeah, I know you said you touch on Seabrook. Yep. But they, bu they bundle a lot of things. They do. We're a very unique town here, you know, with the beach. We go from being a town to a little city. Right. And that little city is really basically from Memorial Day to Labor Day. So we produce tons of cardboard. Mm -hmm. Yep in that time, you know, and I don't really know if it would make sense. And another thing which I've suggested before is glass. Would it, would it not make sense to go to the businesses and stuff and say, look, we want to take glass out of the waste stream here. Mm -hmm. Because the glass is the weight. Yep. That's the tipping piece. That's what's contaminating. And it's a short season. If we worked on a couple of things, we might be able to do something. So Hampton would be a drinking community with a visitor problem. That's what you <laughs> <laughs> um, If I could on the glass, that, that's a, absolutely the weight is what does it. That's the same reason the organics have to come out. Because <coughs> when you take out the organics and the glass, then you've got most of the weight out of your tip fee. So if the tip fee is going to go up, you're going to reduce your cost, no question. Um, we've actually, when in, um, starting last May, we negotiated a contract with a firm up in Montreal that if the glass was clean and just glass, we don't care if the colors are mixed. They'll pick it up, hmm. and they'll turn it into new insulation, and they'll turn it into new glass. If it's not clean, and it's got uh, porcelain in it, like some of the towns do, uh, if it's got ceramics in it, then it can go right to turnkey. And that'll be ground up, and they're going to use it for their expansion under their piping that they have, for methane and that type of thing, for drainage. <coughs> Seabrook has a trailer on site, which we market for. And they put multiple commodities on there. <coughs> they don't get as good pricing, because they're not shipping a full load of cardboard. But in their case, the convenience of having that trailer there and being able to move it out when they need to, that makes more sense because they don't have as much storage. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the price of the materials is on the sheet, and you can see it in the presentation. Cardboard typically runs about 100, 120 in a good year. Yep. Um, sometimes you have contracts, however, with um, single string processors. They don't want you cherry picking the good stuff and just leaving them with the plastic bags. So they want your cardboard because that helps them offset the cost that they're doing. So that, that part has to be worked out. But barring that, the cardboard, the aluminum cans, everything that we do business with um, is making money. We had uh, one town, I just looked at it for the last year, they made over $1,000 just in scrap metal, and I think they were 10000 in plastic. So it might be something that this town might should consider targeting. You should, you should talk about season. it long term, because it, it, everybody wants to stop what they're doing and, like mm -hmm. a knee-jerk reaction. It's, it's not going to be one particular item that's going to solve it. We actually testified in front of the uh, legislature. They're going to actually have a study committee, I hope, if that bill passes. They're going to study it. Well, at least they're going to look at the whole picture instead of just one thing. And that would make sense. 
for towns that have been taking advantage of New Hampshire the Beautiful, which invests and it gives them money for bobcat steers, for uh, containers, um, for floor scales, that kind of thing. For those folks that have done that over periods of time, that transfer station has the ability to make money. Now the town of Derry just went and built one, um, it was $2.4 million, which I wouldn't say every town needs. Mm -hmm. But they, they took in about 450000 last year of revenues. And when that bond is paid off in 20 years, that building won't owe them a dime, and it'll be the only functioning city-owned property that can make money. Mm. Not the school, not the select board, certainly. Uh, <laughs> no, no offense. <laughs> but in terms of generating revenues, and I think long-term, if you look at the trends over the last 20 years, long-term down the road, this material is going to be more valuable. Mm -hmm. We're going to need more of it. I know I've been impressed with Seabrook's <coughs> operation. I'm very familiar with it. Yep. John's, a, John's done a good job over there. And we've, we've been marketing this material, I think, for the last six, seven years. There is a market for material out there for recycling. Recycling is not broken. Mixed paper is a problem. So we've been trying to figure out what can we do with mixed paper besides pay $65 a ton for it. We started last uh, September with an intern from UNH. And I'm hoping she's going to have a positive uh, back from Queensland, Australia, because we're looking to take mixed paper and shred it and use it for animal bedding. Use it for animal bedding, and then you can take, and when it's done, you can put it right in your compost. And UNH would be a great spot to try that. They do that over in, in Australia. It's working out really well, as opposed to throw it away or have to pay. Any questions the board? No, excellent presentation. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, I probably went over a little bit. I get going. One thing I, sh I do want to leave you with. Oh, go ahead. A, a good presentation. I mean, shouldn't we do this in a maybe invite them to a public? You know, invite more of the public to come in here and stuff. We're going to start tomorrow morning showing this presentation on, on Channel 22. Okay, yeah, yeah. because I think it would be great for the for people to come and listen to this. And yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to come back, but I want to leave you with one one piece. Well, I just. Sorry, can I just one thing? Sure. So I know Charlie actually brought up a really good point with the glass, especially in the summertime around here. Yeah. So crushed glass can be used for insulation, right? Did someone say no. that? Or can it, is it clean, some? Clean glass. Clean glass? Yeah. The crushed glass you're going to use in road bed. Right. Okay. Okay. Or you'd use under piping. Yeah. Because it's right. porcelain. Yeah. So ideally, long-term solutions would be if we can take the big things that seem to be plastic and glass right now and figure out a way that we could utilize them well, going forward. If you can get clean plastic ones and twos, the twos are worth about 40 cents a pound, which is about 800 a ton, which is much more than cardboard. Everybody <laughs> thinks about cardboard, it's $100 a ton. Plastic is $800 a ton. Right. I right. a lot. Right. right. So, it, but in terms of weight, the glass and the mm -hmm. organics are the ones that come out. Okay. But it's going to take more. <clears throat> Obviously, it's going to have more manpower. Yes. Labor intensive. Yeah. You're going to have to have either more trucks or people are going to have to bring it to the transfer site themselves. Or, right. Yeah. Uh, so stuff like that. So you know, there, there is. That's what we have to plan for. No question. You've got to do full cost accounting. You've got a you've got a transfer facility that currently accepts uh, folks coming in. So you've got at least that part of your infrastructure. If you had one container that you could put clean glass in that wasn't contaminated. Yeah. We could actually pick that up and haul it or uh, make it a bunker so we could get 30 tons on our truck and it would cost you $35 a, t a ton. Right now it's costing you at least whatever your trash number is, 75, or what your... Now if it has, you're talking clean glass, how about if it has labels on it? Oh yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, I, I, that's right. when, when, we say, yeah, when we say clean, we mean that you can't have ceramics or you, you can't have porcelain. Uh, you can't have rocks in it. You can't have trash in it. It can't be, be just contained. glass. You can't have the metal lids that goes in separate. No, the metal caps. No, that's fine. Okay. Because they'll come out in the process. They understand that. Just like the rings, you don't have to take the rings out. You don't have to take the corks out of it. The cleaner you can make it, the least chance it's going to get rejected. Mm -hmm. So if we if we start at least started by that with voluntarily people bringing it into the transfer station. Every ton that comes in with it, that goes through that program will cost you thirty five bucks. Colored glass. Yes. Any glass. Any glass. Just as long glass, as it's glass, glass. Glass. Pickle Not jar, trash. Whatever. Glass. glass. The good news is that we're going to have to do that within the year because we've already been told by waste management they will accept no more glass for recycling. Yeah. yeah. You're going to see more and more of that. And they, they actually yeah. did that in the Houston contract, was where their home base is. Great. Our contracts are all up in a year. Yep. So. Yeah. yeah. You're going to be hit with the same numbers. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely.
And I, I did forget, I, sh I should tell you, the reason I'm hopeful that something's going to change is because it can change. My mother um, was on a Carnival Cruise uh, tour. Um, we were a little nervous because this is the first one she'd gone on by herself uh, since my dad had passed away. But anyway, she was dying to go on this cruise. And she was standing on the back end, the fantail of the ship, and all of a sudden you could see these plastic bags oh. into the ocean. That's romantic. This was a while ago. Yeah, well, she, oh, <laughs> I won't go into that part. But in any event, she's standing there and she's seeing this trash go out the back of the ship. She said, oh my God, that's terrible. We grew up on Cape Cod, Flatlander. Um, and every Sunday, we'd go and walk Harding's Beach and pick up the trash and maybe a nickel or a bottle or something. And in any event, uh, that night, she went right down to the captain's table and said, you're going to stop doing that. That is not OK. And you're going to stop throwing trash in the ocean. Miami Herald the next morning. Carnival Cruise Lines announces it won't throw any more trash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she had nothing to do with it whatsoever, but it, it was just, it was her. It was her. Perfect timing. What can you do? Thank you. If you have thank any other you. questions afterwards, you know, whenever you know where to reach, Fred knows that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank I think you. Thank you. Much. Excellent thank presentation. You. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. Okay. The next one up is Amanda Keys. Thanks again. That was Thank you. that was an excellent presentation. While Amanda gets set up, I'll give a little introduction. Okay, uh, Carl. For those online are watching, uh, my name is Carl McMoran. I'm the operations manager at Aquarion. And uh, Amanda's here to uh, talk about a main replacement project. <coughs> We, uh, you know what easel is? No. no. That's all right. That stand has disappeared. Again. Yes. Anyway, we have our big main replacement <coughs> project. This is uh, one of two transmission lines that leads Hampton Beach. It's down the, goes from Tide Mill Road out across the marsh to the tank on Church Road. And, uh, we are uh, one of our reliability projects. You still have the point. Not like there's a major risk of failure, but there's always some risk. Uh, it can be very expensive to fix it, so we're going we're to relocate it up along the edge of uh, Route 101 uh, before we have a bigger problem to deal with. So I'm going to turn over to Amanda. You're going down the opposite side of the that we went down, right? Yep, correct. South side of the That's correct. Area. Yes. So, um, so the existing main is in orange. Starts up. It, comes down the tide mill path or Bartell Court and then goes down, goes through the marsh and then comes back onto um, Church Street. So the new main will tie in at the end of tide mill, that tide mill path, that, sorry, Bartell Court, and then cross 101, go down the opposite side as the force main is on now, and then cross back over 101 um, to Church Street. So what well, we're looking for approval at, um, from the Board of Selectmen for is the, the tie-in is in Bartell Court. It's a class six road. And so basically the tie-in will be um, right at the end of, of Bartell Court where that the existing water main starts up that path. Right. Um, we'll tie in as soon as we can, cut in a T to extend the new main and at the end of the project the old the existing main shown in orange here will be abandoned in place. Mary Lewis. Yeah. What's, what material is this line going to be made out of? The new main is going to be 16 inch um, high density <coughs> polyethylene pipe. So we're not going to have any more rotten, rotting iron pipes or whatever in the marsh. <laughs> right. Yeah, the existing main <coughs> is cast iron and the new main will be And HDP. It's hard for me to tell from that, but uh, this is, uh, you have the orange line will be your new line. And you're not going to be too close to the old. The uh, actually the orange line is the existing, existing line, oh, line okay. and the blue line is the proposed. You know. The blue, okay, but you won't go anywhere near the old uh, sewer line that was. Yeah, the old sewer line is similar to the um, so the existing water main okay. was also in the marsh. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So any questions from the board? Yeah. All right, I'm sorry, Regina. Um, when is, if this gets approved, when are you planning on starting? Um, so we're expecting to have um, approval through through the state and Army Corps 
um, mid-April. And assuming we have our approvals from um, DOT as well, we need to coordinate with DOT, then yeah. we would start as soon as possible after that. And cool. how, how long do you think the project's going to um, take? 12 weeks is that our estimate for the right. total project. Probably eight weeks for the majority of the water main work and a month for the yeah. um, directional drill under the river. Because starting in like June, mid-June, end yeah. of June, it's pretty, uh, that's getting pretty chaotic down there. Right. And that's like the main exit. Yeah, road. sort of struggling with DOT also yeah. would like to pave that road as, as soon as possible, that section road. So working yeah. with them as well to try to get the work done Good. as soon as possible. And how old is that pipe? The that existing pipe, was it 1950s? Sometime or? in the mid-50s. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. In the connection at the Church Street end, where is it going to connect to um, the, from the old to the new? At the, at the water tower? At the west end of Church Street, actually. The pipe in Church Street um, is in decent condition. They haven't had any issues in the past with that, um, so they're going to maintain that in Church Street. Because, again, like Regina said, obviously, if you're starting in the end of April in 12 weeks, yeah. you're right mm -hmm. in the height of summer, and it's going to be pretty crazy down there. And just yeah. It'll be hectic mm -hmm. for the for the for uh, both the business and our, our citizens. So. Probably better than snow and ice. Well, that's probably we'll, better. We'll do our best to you know, keep things moving smoothly. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? No. Nope. What do they need now, Fred? I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that you, the board, make a motion and approve it to uh, to grant the permit to use Bechtel Court because that's really what we're here for. Right. We're we'll we'll all state, I'll state material, and that the permit and and the requirements for inspections and so forth, mm -hmm. in addition to what they're going to inspect through their engineers be issued through the Department of Public Works, so yeah. we coordinate everything on the town property. Yeah. I'll so second moved. Mr. Griffin. Moved, seconded. All those in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You. So right. just get with Public Works and Good. we'll get you going. Get you going. Okay, the next one up is John Burns, SOS Recovery Community Organization. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. And just so while he he's here, one of the Mr. You can keep yours. I got mine. You got We've already. Right. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've got one too. Good. Put that in the permanent record. Yeah, it's right there. Um, you know. I, when we had some questions come up, I asked Mr. Burns to come in yes. and, and give the explanation. Uh, he's uh, he's looking, he's proposing to bring his services to town to an area that's generally zoned, and so he, by rights, the Board of Selectmen has no control or authority whether he moves into town or not, but I felt it was good for him to come here and at least explain what he's got going on and let us all know. Thank you. Um, so my name is John Burns. I'm the director for SOS Recovery Community Organization. We're a program of Greater Seacoast Community Health, um, which is the combined entities of Goodwin Community Health up in Summersworth, as well as Families First in Portsmouth. So we've been around for a long time. Um, we have two recovery community we have two recovery community centers. One is in Rochester, and one is in Dover currently. Um, we opened our first recovery center in September of 2016 up in Rochester, and then we opened a second one in April of 2017. And what we are is um, we're peer-based recovery support. So for that, that's um, it's a combination of a number of different services, but it's you know one thing. It's, it's almost easier to explain what we're not. Which so we're not any sort of clinical treatment. We don't provide any sort of medication. We don't have any clinical staff. Um, it's all peer-based recovery. So that, so for that, we have you'll see I handed in those that packet a calendar. That's the type of activities which range from any, anywhere from 12-step meetings to um, other different pathways. We're very supportive of multiple pathways to recovery. We have yoga. We have art and recovery. We have music and recovery meetings. And, and then for services, what we tend to provide is peer-based recovery coaching. So that's mostly one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's provided by peers who are mostly volunteers, sometimes by staff, but most of our staff is really focused on building volunteer capacity. And those individuals have all been through a 30-hour recovery coach training, which is 
pretty widely accepted nationally through an organization out of Connecticut called CCAR. Um, we also provide, um, so they, they go through that, and we also require that every individual take a 16-hour ethics course um, with us. Most of the individuals who do coaching are, are on a route to get what's called in New Hampshire a Certified Recovery Support Worker Credential, or CRSW. That requires some additional training. It requires 500 hours of direct service. It requires 25 hours supervised by a master's licensed alcohol and drug counselor. Um, and we do telephone recovery support. So, and that is, that's what we do is we call people who sign up and it's mostly individuals who can't make it into the center. Some of them is just, they, they're not comfortable walking into the center yet. They're in early recovery. They've been through treatment and they're looking for a connection. We call them once a week just to check in on them and see how they're doing. Um, a lot of times that might be parents or families who, you know, they can't, they don't have childcare so they can't come into the center at that time or they don't have transportation, they're rural. Um, and, and it's just a check-in call to see how they're doing and see how we can help connect them to services mm -hmm. if they need it. We do a lot of crisis navigation, so individuals coming in looking for treatment. Um, in Dover, we offer a program with Wentworth Douglas Hospital, so we do we have on-call per diem employees who are recovery coaches, and the hospital utilizes us in a fee-for-service contract where they dispatch us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So anybody who comes into the hospital presenting with a substance use disorder, any nurse, doctor, social worker, or whatever can dispatch a coach if they feel it's appropriate. Um, so about 20 times a month usually we get dispatched to the hospital um, at all hours of the day and night. We do it in the inpatient treatment. It's not just the emergency department, it's throughout the hospital, um, although the majority of the calls go to the emergency department. Mm -hmm. So as you know, as you, or you may not know, the doorway or the hub system that the governor has set up here in New Hampshire for Hampton, Wentworth Douglas Hospital, is actually the doorway. So one of the thoughts that we're looking at is we're working very closely with Wentworth Douglas, so we already have kind of some connections and, and it'll help ease navigation for individuals who might need treatment, especially as far as Hampton is from Dover. Um, figuring out how we can provide, you know, connect people transportation-wise, but either way, at least they'll have warm bodies who kind of know the system and can help navigate people into that. Because right now, the, the reality is if you're looking for help, um, oftentimes people go into the hospital and they're given a, a card that says here call these numbers and most of those places will have two three week waiting lists to get in um, you know as much as we're developing this hub and spoke system the spokes aren't aren't at a capacity and one of the reasons why we identified this area is kind of the line between here and Epping is almost referred to as a service desert as it relates to substance use disorders there's not many services available so we wanted to help fill that void. Um, and we're also hopeful that because of what we've done with Wentworth Douglas, as most of you know, Exeter Hospital is kind of becoming part of that Wentworth Douglas system through Mass General, through their mergers. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to duplicate a lot of what we're doing at Wentworth Douglas at Exeter Hospital as well and kind of build a bigger infrastructure and build, her, build a bigger connection with community. Uh, most of our services is, is based on lived experience for individuals and family members. Um, we do a sober parenting journey, so that's for parents who have children under the age of 10 to come in and we, f we give them a family style meal once a week. It lasts 14 weeks. We provide free transportation for them. Um, and it's a two hour weekly training that kind of works on both parenting, your traditional parenting type skills, but it also incorporates into it a lot of self esteem building and how to navigate the combination of parenting and navigating early recovery from substance use disorder and um, and kind of build that level of self-esteem and that self-worth for those parents so that they're building that family unit unit more in a more healthy manner so we do that we provide free transportation for a free meal and free child care when we do that um, so hopefully we'll be able to get one we've run two now up in Rochester where we started a third we start a third tomorrow night and uh, our plan would be to try and get one up and running down here in Hampton as well for that. So um, we run a grandparent group for guardians and grandparents to help kind of navigate resources for grandparents. So it's not just about individuals. It's really kind of a whole family thing. Um, we've had over 10, and last year we had 10,000 visits total between the two centers. So we're pretty busy. We have about 1,000, just under 1,100 individual unique members 
what we call them. We, we take intakes for people who you want to use the services. They fill out like a kind of a lengthy application. Um, we accept everybody, but they have to f they fill that out so that we can get demographic data and stuff for our funding from the state. Um, some of it's useful, some of it not so much, but <laughs> um, but we do do that. So we, we keep a pretty close eye on data and demographics and who's using the centers and a lot of that stuff for our funders. So, um, but that's kind of the rough overview of what we do. More than happy to take questions or Mary Louise. Yes. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity over the weekend to uh, go to some material, uh, I guess, that had been passed out. I do have some questions. Um, I'm sort of surprised that there is no uh, state uh, oversight. There are apparently no state or, or local oversight. Um, you know, legally, you're, you are in a position where you're dealing with people, many of whom probably have a lot of problems. And I'm just kind of concerned. Um, there's nothing you can do about it, but I'm kind of concerned that the legislature, um, since you are going to be opening these facilities in the state, uh, might want to uh, take a look at it. You, uh, you said that you have Narcan on site. I know that's to help people come off whatever it is they're doing. But is that a danger? Uh, what if somebody breaks into the facility? Or I guess it's readily available. Right. Yeah, Narcan's the brand name. It's, it's, so the generic name is called Naloxone. Uh -huh. It's a life-saving opiate reversal medication, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, two, three years ago, I think now, the state passed public distribution, passed laws yeah. to allow public distribution without fear of any sort of liability for individuals who administer it. Mm. Um, Narcan and or naloxone has no abuse potential. So oh, okay. if you were to take it and squirt, it's nasal, it's a yeah. nasal squirt, okay. basically. Um, if you were to squirt some in my nose right now, I'd probably get a runny nose <laughs> and a headache, and it would do absolutely nothing. Okay. So the good news is it can't be misused. It so can't a really burglar's be. burglar's not going to break in to get the Narcan. Okay. No, not unless there's like a dark... <laughs> black market for Narcan that I'm not and aware of. Now it says in this article that was published in the Hampton Union, it said you're waiting for $100,000 from the state's opioid response money to pay for um, much of the operation startup. Now if this is going to be the third facility, mm -hmm. Dover, Rochester, and Hampton, um, I wonder how long that opioid um, uh, response money is going to hold out. Are you going to have a problem with funding? We'd, I'm, we've, so one of the things we've gone through is an accreditation process through, a, there's a council called the Council for Accreditation of Peer Recovery Support Services. Oh, okay. they're, they're the only ones nationally that do it. There's about 12 to 15 in not organizations. In they're not based in New Hampshire. They're based out of D.C. Okay. Um, part of the whole state funding that initially came through for us that yeah. kind of got those centers up was that you had to be accreditation ready. Hmm. And we were you were scored on that. Um, since then, we were the second organization in the state to become accredited. We received an exemplary at accreditation. And to answer your question, a big portion of that is building sustainability. Okay. Um, so, yes, if, if the state determined tomorrow that they weren't funding recovery community organizations, we're in big trouble. I would has, be hesitant to think that that's mm -hmm. going to happen right now, given the state of the state. Yeah. Um, the state opioid response money is, is a two-year federal funding stream, so we know it's available for two years. Get you started, yeah. Um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with the other streams, and we also are going to receive money from the Integrated yeah. Delivery Network. Has Preliminarily, it's a verbal. It hasn't been finalized, but they're looking yeah. to fund one of the positions there to help supplement okay. that. Now, what about privacy? I, I guess I would call them clients that you have. Mm -hmm. Suppose individuals have been misbehaving. Uh, is there going to be some availability for the Hampton Police Department or for uh, our first responders from our fire department to know what's, what's happening? Or is there any, do you do any background or have any, any personal um, record of each of these clients that mm -hmm. can be referenced? We keep some demographic data. Um, we are, so they're met, so anything related to substance use disorder federally yeah. is a protected, 
that's protected by HIPAA and 42 CFR. So we do put confidential protections in there, but and you'll see in there there's a letter from the chief of police with Dover. I read that. So, I mean, we work pretty closely. If there's issues, um, and there really hasn't been any like that, yeah. um, but if, you know, again, if there's like an imminent risk or yeah. threat, we're obviously going to work okay. with police to make sure that, because yeah. we, we have to worry about our own members and our own volunteers as okay. well, so we're, we certainly now, don't want anything. My final question, because we are now, you're now coming down to the east coast in the state and the southern, the eastern part of the state. Are we talking about individuals only in New Hampshire, or are we going to have individuals coming across state line? You could have individuals coming across state line. We have, ver I mean, I can tell you demographics where we're up in Stratford County, we're right on the yeah. line with Maine. Maine, is, Maine has far less services than Massachusetts yeah. does yeah. <laughs> for this type of stuff. Yeah. And it's less than 5% of our, of our, of the individuals that come in, come from Maine and they'll come, they'll, okay. you know, literally Berwick is a 10 minute ride. Le okay. Lebanon's a 10 minute ride. To and that's not a problem crossing state lines. No, I mean, we're going to provide services to anybody who needs it. I don't see a large influx because, honestly, Massachusetts has more services for substance use mm -hmm. disorder than we do. So they're typically, it's, you know, in fact, Massachusetts smartened up to New Hampshire because we were constantly sending people down to their state-funded treatment beds yeah. to get okay. substance use disorder treatment, and now they're really strict about okay. IDs and stuff. Thank you. But, yeah, we don't provide clinical services, so there's no true treatment that okay. people would be accessing. It's just recovery supports. Go ahead, Regina. Yes. I, I just want to make a couple comments, is it okay? Sure. I've heard Mr. Burns speak now about three times in the past week, okay. and uh, I appreciate it, and I really appreciate you coming here tonight, because what happened was it was a public informational session that I found out about, couldn't go, right. mm -hmm. and some public went, and they weren't happy. I didn't have answers to give them. So it was sort of unfortunate for both of us. But uh, we have answers now. And I also want to say that, like I said, every time I listen to you, I'm a lot more calm about the situation. Not everyone is used to this. Right. I've had, I don't even know, it's around 12 people that I grew up with die mm -hmm. from, some of them didn't even know that they had a problem. Mm -hmm. So I know that the situation is very real, but at the same time as a selectman, when I get answered questions that I can't answer, it's frustrating for me. Mm -hmm. So after the Monday meeting that we had again at the police station, I then went to the first Seacoast Rotary sponsored event in Exeter mm -hmm. and got, the governor was at that one. And I just wanted to say a couple of things that I think will answer your questions. And uh, I know that Sununu is, <laughs> you know, he's, he's very pro, well, I guess it's not proactive, it's probably not a good word, but He's very cautious of what's happening in New Hampshire, and he wants to fix it, and that's very good to see. But um, after my attendance, and I wrote this down because I want to say it just like this, so I apologize, but I'm going to read. After the attendance of the second Hampton informational session and the first of our, and the first of four scheduled forums sponsored by the New Hampshire New, ha New Hampshire Seacoast Rotary Clubs at Exeter High School last Tuesday evening. Explanations and information have calmed most of my concerns that I have heard. There will be remaining forums. One will be April 11th at Portsmouth High School, May 9th here at Wanaconnet, and then June 3rd they're having one at Wentworth Douglas. So if anyone wants to go in person, get this information. It is a relief. It will calm you. If you have any questions, please go. Um, it was very positive to hear from the governor that he has recently secured 45 million from the Trump administration to fight the mental <laughs> health disease here in New Hampshire. Also, there is already an appropriated 50 million in state funding to be combined for a total of 95 million, which is interesting information obtained. Um, according to the Exeter High School Forum Tuesday evening, four out of five heroin users start out on prescription drugs. Why are we not hitting the pharmaceutical companies harder for overprescribing? This subject was also discussed at the Exeter Forum by Jim and Jeannie Mazur, who lost their young son to this crisis. His addiction seemed to start from leftover prescriptions prescribed to his father for medical operation. These parents are the founders of Zero Left, which I guess you could probably explain that better than me, but it's what to do if you have overprescribed medication, how to get rid of them. And uh, also, from a financial standpoint, currently we spend roughly $600 billion 
on uh, drug misuse annually in this nation. Mm -hmm. So I thought those were some interesting facts. That's Jim? all I have to say. Yeah. Well, thank you for what you're doing, and I think it's a great service. And I think, you know, that you've calmed people's worries about what's going on, you know, and oftentimes, you know, you have the NIMBY attitude, and, and that's too bad on a lot of social things. But I think peer counseling is a great thing, and it works real well. So I thank you. I think you're doing a good job, and I think it's a good organization. Well, thank you. And I would yeah. encourage people, too, if, if anybody has concerns, both our Dover and Rochester Center, Dover is open now seven days a week. Um, we have pretty long hours in Dover. We're open 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. six days and 12 to 4 on Sundays. And then Rochester's open 9 to 5. Stop in. If you don't need an appointment, it's open to the public all day long, every day. If you want to make an appointment, I'm happy to meet people there too. <laughs> but, you know, for the sake of transparency, if people are concerned, just I always tell people, like, come in. We'll give you plenty. we got plenty of coffee. Um, we'll yeah, it strikes me that um, your program is very similar to AA. Uh, 12-step program that you're inviting people in to discuss their problems and work on them together. And I know that um, no matter where you go in the world, you can cross the state lines and or country lines and be welcomed at an AA meeting. And it sounds to me that this is very similar. And all the people from being coming from the different areas probably <coughs> have a lot to share that um, might inspire some of the other people. Mm -hmm. And I know from looking through my um, information here tonight that Kathleen Murphy is uh, very supportive of this, even though it's close to the schools and this and that. She has no problem with it, and she sees mm -hmm. how it will benefit uh, potentially the students and their parents. And, um, and looking out here in the audience tonight, I know that there's people here that this means a lot to. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. And uh, so I think it's a great thing. Well, thank you. Thank you. And we are, there is that mutual, so the 12-step fellowship is a mutual support group. Um, the unique thing about us is, is we, we certainly embrace that, and oftentimes we'll have 12-step meetings in, in the centers, but we also embrace as many different pathways as we can possibly provide. And I always kind of liken it to throwing spaghetti at the wall. Um, we know that there's a lot that's not working, so let's keep throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks until it does because, frankly, people are dying and we need to keep them alive. And it's not just from drugs either. It's, you know, I often I kind of shudder at the opiate crisis language and say it's an addiction crisis. We have as much alcoholism as we do yep. opiate addiction in this country, and, and it's killing, you know, alcohol kills more people than opioids do, so... Yeah, we did, we did receive a letter from the uh, superintendent of schools, and I don't know if you got a copy of that or not. I did not. I'll give you mine, uh, so you'll have it. Um, but she is in, in full support of what you're doing. We did notice the, the letter in here from the chief in Dover. Mm -hmm. I know I've been to at least four of these meetings now. Um, you're going to do the presentations. I, <laughs> I've, learned, I've learned a lot, but I also appreciate Tracy for the, for the questions you asked because it got the questions out there yeah. and it got people talking about it. And I think the more people get to know and the more they learn, the less afraid they're going to be. So I appreciate right. you doing that. Uh, I appreciate John coming up here and all the people that have come with you. I think it's uh, been an excellent opportunity. I uh, wish all the best, whatever Thanks. we can do to help. And I do. I, I, I appreciate tr me and Tracy have talked extensively over the phone. We, we've met in person and talked since the first forum. Um, and I encourage people to do that. A big part of our mission is to reduce stigma. If we're not educating people, then we're not reducing stigma. So I think that's an important piece is to have those conversations and address those concerns if people are concerned. Absolutely. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You have so. counseling for stressed out selectmen? <laughs> um, some need that. I need it as much as we have. We need counseling for stressed out employees, too. Yeah. <laughs> Probably true. Probably true. Thank you again, John. The next one up is Charlie Preston. Charlie, how are you? Good, Jim. There's some green here. You might get a kick out of it. With all the rest of this? Thank you. It's all right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 
Where did this come from, Charlie? 1953. Oh, 53. It's, that's two years older than I am. Wow. But, um, excuse me. I just wanted a little shout out to the Hampton Historical Society because the hard work they do makes my job easy. <laughs> Sometimes we all think we're more important than we really are. In reality, we're all a speck in time. If we put our heads together, we will get better results. I'd like to read a quick piece of history, which I would bet, which I would bet is factual versus some, some of the news we read today. Install register system at beach parking lots. A modern, up-to-date registering system was installed Tuesday morning in both the town-owned parking lots at Hampton Beach, along with a sweeping revision of existing rates. Although there will be no change in the daily parking charge of 25 cents, the Board of Selectmen has eliminated all weekly, monthly, and seasonal rates which were found to be in existence and will, will enforce the no free parking privileges of residents of the town, which were revoked by a meet, meeting of the annual meeting last March. The heart of this light of type, the heart of this latest type of registering device for parking areas is national cash register, is a national cash register which rejects a number and data ticket each time the attendant pushes a button and records the daily and seasonal total on separate slips. The selectmen have purchased two of these machines at a cost of $610, <laughs> which at today's rates is a little under $6,000. <laughs> for both parking lots on Ocean Boulevard and Marsh Ave, Mr. Henry Bodwell, Hampton, High Street, Hampton, has been retained by the town to supervise both parking areas and will have complete charge charge of the personal of the personnel and the checking of daily receipts which will be deposited with town treasurer norm merrill each day under the new system the selectmen have also made it clear that all employees in the attendance were given the opportunity to remain under the new system and it is expected that there will be little change in personnel the inauguration of this new system was made in accordance with a vote of the townspeople of the annual town meeting last march which authorized the installation of a similar system that empl that's employed by the state in like areas. Now that was 1953. <laughs> so we had 66 years, so history just repeats itself. You know, if you look back, that's you true. can look up um, Beachcomber Archives, the Hampton Historical Society, and all the problems that we have down the beach are just the same things that happen over and over. The names and faces change. Um, what I would like to talk about was two weeks ago I came in with the JOP. When, when, um, what's it, I call it dread, but National Parks, the cultural, whatever. And I mentioned snow plowing. They tried, but what they said was going to happen and what happened, you know, what actually has happened is, hasn't worked out as quite as well as they thought. I also mentioned, you know, requesting the seasoned parking violations because I think it's hurting our beach. I was told I would get them November 7th. I didn't get any. When I came into this meeting, I brought it up. I got a call two days later before the HBAC meeting, and I was looking for the shoulder seasons parking violations because it hurts our town, our image. Um, when the parking is half price in April and October, there was 286 tickets written in, in April by the state down at the beach. Worse was in October when 446 individuals got tickets. Mm -hmm. And the parking lots are pretty much empty then. Yeah. So if you said there's an average, let's, let's figure conservative, say two people a car, that's a thousand people yeah. that know about those tickets that are going back to where they're from, bad mouthing Hampton. So we need to sit down with the, you know, the state and take a look at you know, state mm -hmm. parks and really sit down and you know, sharpen our pencils here. Um, About, let's see, this, this, this just isn't good, good advertising. Word of mouth can be your best or worst advertising. This is not the way to end the season. We need to lead by example. We need to set the bar. By changing the way we run this lot, we can achieve user-friendly fairness and realize increased revenues that make the private lots charging 30, 40, 50 and up to get away from the shell games and create more repeat business versus one-hit wonders which are people that come once and wonder why mm -hmm. and act accordingly, knowing they won't be coming back. 
Now is the time to move forward in a fair and equitable way. This is something that makes revenue. Let's get right now. How about if we piggyback with the state parks and try to get onto their system at this parking lot? And what I'm talking about is in front of the police station. I've talked about it before, splitting it and, you know, trying from Ashworth from uh, Brown Avenue. Recently, a local paper reported the Hampton Beach leaders were ready for a promotional blitz. Blitz the chamber trying to get some money to advertise to get people down the beach, but stuff like this needs to be corrected before we put, start throwing good money at bad. You know, it's the same old news because history does repeat itself. The names and faces change, the stories don't. When families come to Hampton Beach and get gouged for parking or get in a ticket in an empty parking lot, I guarantee we will slide backwards again. On the meeting on February 25th, I put out a challenge to the state, the town, the Hampton Beach Village District, the rec department, the chamber, local clubs, the business community, and any of the past, present, or future SECO's leaders to raise funds to construct the nicest playground on the East Coast at the State Park by the bridge. <laughs> that would be free to all year round without the worry of money or tickets. If you truly want to break families and keep them coming back, show with actions, not words. Um, when I put in my request, it was probably I was scribbling because they said I was to talk about the town parking lot and square at the beach. The square thing was actually signage, was, was my word that I had on there. And we have a sign probably for 10 years, and I don't know how many people here know it. I met 10 years ago with John Nyan and Diana Martin and Chuck Ridge, and I was trying to get a marquee sign at the bottom of Highland Ave so we could change it and put events up. What happened over the years, you know, from Public Works and that, when Dig Safe came, there was just so much stuff going on, they really couldn't put it there. But this sign is sitting over in a tuck building, brand new, and it's the state, it's top of the line, marquee sign, you change the letters, the old style, but it's, a, it's really good material. I wanted to know if we could have that sign put up from the back of the parking lot sign on the Ashwood Dev lot. Anybody who wants to see it, I don't know what I'm talking about. There's a sign that tells us World War II Veterans Parking Lot. It's right where the emergency siren is. Out front, it's right, right next to it, so if you want to know. The back side of that, the foundation to it is sauna tubes with two four by six pressure treated coming out and they're bare on the back side. So it could be installed there very quick, very cheap. We already own it and we can start to put up, you know, like plowing how we want them to park certain ways and the tides, what, you know, when, when the high tides are coming. It's an informational sign we own it and I'm gonna see if we can just get it done. But I wanna thank you very much for your time and I hope we can do some serious consideration on this parking and, uh, you know, talk to the state and see what they think as far as the kiosk go. Well, we have one of our, our state representatives right behind you or Senators. Senator. So I think he's heard your your loud and clear here. And Pat Bushway's on the committee. And she, yeah. I think she's so gone. She's already. gone, but she's she's yeah. working on it. Yeah, she's working on it. We, we uh, got the greatest delegation going. We'll, we'll have them look and see if the sign is over there. Again, as with anything, you, you're talking manpower and time to put it up. You and I can do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. <laughs> Two old fat guys. Changing it. Yeah. <laughs> And changing it weekly and stuff like that, and we got to see you know, we'll know a lot more after tomorrow and see what the budget does and, yeah. and see yeah. what it does because uh, I, I am hesitant about adding anything to if we don't if we go to a default budget. So, but. yeah, I, I, I just is it a good looking sign? It is, I, I mean, love the look the surplus. I, I just personally, I hate the, the electronic signs. I know they're good for giving information. Right. But a sign that looked nice. I think it would be better. To put up events, I think, would be something Absolutely. that adds a little class, you know, rather than, I mean, electronic <laughs> signs are great, but they. No. Yeah. In the gym, yeah. In the gym, <laughs> I don't think so. Electronic sign was put in the same location, I'm going to say within 10 feet of this, and it got blown over. Oh. <laughs> so. yeah, probably. Yeah. Regina. Um, yeah, I agree. We already have it, right? So, I mean, yeah. I think if we can manage to do it, that's definitely a great idea. And I like how you said you could diagram out, like, what the parking would be yeah. if we it's decided at one point in time to maybe let residents park for free in some areas down the beach, if they have a resident sticker. 
Um, also, I think that that's a great idea. I think there's a lot of things we have to start with, talk with state parks about, and also DOT, so that we can solve our all our issues, including the parking. And I know that people getting tickets on a dead day down there when the lots, I mean, I'm down there, and it's like, you know, I leave my bike to go across the street to get a soda, nervous that I'm going to get a ticket when there's like no one down there. I mean, that's like not Hampton Beach family friendly. 450 so, in October. Yeah, that's crazy. So I think that that's something that uh, we should definitely look into. Thanks, Charlie, for yep, your thoughts. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Charlie. Well, you're looking, Charlie. My suggestion is that somebody look, unless they've changed the process, a number of years ago, if you appealed your ticket, it was the commissioner who said on the appeal, these tickets do not go to court for adjudication. Huh. Unless they've changed the system, that's the same system that's going on. You do not sit in front of a judge. Hmm. Everybody else does on a traffic ticket. Well, I'm familiar with the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, town manager's report. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, please vote tomorrow. Yeah. We certainly need that. When it comes to high school, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., don't forget your vote instructs us on what you want your government to do for the coming year. It's very important that you get there and vote and instruct us on what you want us to do. The town clerk's office is going to be closed tomorrow, election day, March 12th, as all the clerk's employees will be working at the polls. The Department of Public Works will be holding a public input session on Wednesday, March 13th, 2019, beginning at 6 p.m. in this room, the Selectman's Meeting Room in the Town Office, concerning the upcoming drainage and parking improvements on Lafayette Road. Please bring your concerns and suggestions for the staff. The period for filing abatements for 2018 property taxes closed on March 1. All of those interested in filing for elderly, veterans, handicapped, or other exemptions under the statute, including for the Hampton Beach Precinct exemption, must do so by April 15th. Please see the assessing office for information and required forms. Very important that you get that in here on time. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have requested department heads to file all of their CIP reports by April 30th, 2019 for the 2020 to 25 calendar seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, this Friday I will be issuing, um, as March 15th, I will be issuing the request for budgets for 2020. <laughs> uh, I realize the department has just absolutely loved this, but it takes some time to put these together and uh, they're going to be due June 28th so we can get them to the board in timely fashion. Um, we have received a letter from the Pease Authority. As the board is aware, we have, in fact, issued all the requirements that are necessary to dredge the harbor for the Corps of Engineers and for the state of New Hampshire. Uh, the information that I have received is that they're planning on removing approximately 150,000 cubic yards of sand material from the harbors. This material is going to be placed at various locations as approved by the state and federal governments. And the work will not begin until October 1st and will end on March 15th next year. Mm -hmm. So See, through the winter next year. It's through the winter because of the, uh, the seasonal migration of different species, both mm. uh, aquatic and, and otherwise, uh, so that it will not damage that relationship that we have with the environment mm -hmm. and those animals. Uh, we ha are scheduled, um, we have request, been requested to, to, to uh, put together a schedule with the State Department of Environmental Services for inspection of the new Old Mill Pond Dam. Yes. That's being done as we, as we sit here. Uh, so that should be done sometime relatively soon. We have had a request to remove the remainder of the trees on Academy Avenue. Uh, more and more branches have fallen down off those trees. Uh, one narrowly missed someone cleaning their own driveway this past, st not past storm, but two storms ago. Mm -hmm. And people are getting to be very concerned about the fact the trees are very old. They were put in as a, uh, a memorial to President Lincoln at the, the time of his death. And uh, so they have a couple of days on them. Uh, all of them have been shedding branches, uh, but yeah. I would need the selectman's permission to remove those trees if that's what you wish to do. Yeah. Most of them are gone already. And it's because they the would affect them. 
So it's up to the board whether or not we remove those. Fred, so, it's wrecking yeah. the sidewalk. Well, people are walking in the street. It is uh, digging up the sidewalk because of the root systems. Yeah. And uh, the sidewalks would have to be completely rebuilt yep. uh, sometime in the future because of that. Uh, the Department of Public Works, um, well, we already said that. They, they want you to come and talk about the drainage out on Lafayette Road and up on High Street and, yep. and on, on uh, Quinnacunnet Road. Very important that that be done. There is a tentative schedule of 3 p.m. August 2. I don't know why they put August 2. It should be April 2. Um, for dedication of the Hampton District Court. It's August 2nd. Is it August 2nd? It's August 2nd. Okay, all right. Uh, I was told that they had put the wrong date on it. No, nah, uh, I, I was, I, I questioned that same thing and yeah. uh, I asked and that, that was confirmed because they have two or three other courthouses yeah. and all the pe same people go to the same things. They have the a plethora of things to do. So they're all going to okay. do it on one date yeah. and that's August 7th. At least they okay. started it with an A. That's it. We had, we had a visit in town this past week from, uh, actually a little bit more than a week ago, from our new federal representative, uh, Mr. Pappas. Uh, who came and, and uh, uh, talked about matters dealing with climate change. Um, we were notified, but it came on spam, and we didn't discover it until a Tuesday following, mm. two days following his, mm. his, his thing. I, I've corresponded with his office. That won't happen again. Yeah. Uh, I, so I, that, I called him Monday morning and, and said the same thing, that I didn't yeah. get it until Monday, but it came on yeah. my spam, and I, I couldn't make it. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, they cool. said they would try to do a better job. We've opened the communication channel. That won't happen again. So just so people know, no, we didn't miss it on purpose. We missed it because we didn't know it was there. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we have posted effective uh, just recently, just this past weekend, uh, for the filling of the vacancy for the deputy fire chief. Uh, examination will be sometime at the beginning of May. And we have received official correspondence from the Department of Transportation thanking the town selectman for signing the rail trail agreement with DOT. <laughs> and I think I've given a copy of that to all of you just, just so you have it. Um, we did have a small spill, um, and Jen is here, I think. Uh, she can explain in, it to you better March. than I can. Yeah. Um, well, actually, we don't believe it went anywhere, um, but we did have to notify the state that we had a potential spill yeah. of uh, sewage uh, and two locations, uh, the department of transit, the de department has, our department has tested and mm. found absolutely nothing in mm. the water at any of the locations that we need to be concerned of. Mm. However, the state for safety reasons, uh, because they didn't have time to test, uh, in fact, closed the clam beds as they're supposed to yeah. do. But there was, as far as we can see, absolutely no contamination from our testing. I think a neighbor reported that. Actually, no, it was no. something that was reported by our own contractor. Oh, really? Uh, oh. Who, who, who just went and did what he needed to do because a pump failed. Oh, so, okay. And that's it, sir. Any questions of the I have questions of the town Go manager. Ahead. Yes, uh, U.S. Congressman comes to town, five members of the board, email going to spam, mm -hmm. not acceptable. Yeah. Okay? I don't open my spam emails because the finance director received an email from me the other day asked telling her that I changed my bank account and my current bank account was going to close. But guess what? Email didn't come from me. Okay? So there's issues that we have. So ex emails that go to spam, unacceptable. I want a phone call. Like when the governor comes on, I get a phone mm -hmm. call. When Senator Hassan came to give the fire department grant, I got a phone call. Okay? Because I'm not going to be making any decisions on climate change and do we take how much of the uh, dirt are we going to be taking out of the harbor? 150,000 cubic yards? Yeah, so let's do some of that and then we can make decisions on climate change with the elected body that's responsible yeah. for the uh, town. Thank you. Good. In fact, we do now receive telephone calls from everybody. This new representative is the only one we hadn't received a call uh -huh. from. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so, so we've arranged to make every sure other that we, time have, I've gotten a call. Good. we have proper communications. Yeah. yeah. I was at that meeting. It was one of the most informative meetings that I've been to. Mm -hmm. And I think that he did a better job than any elected official has in the last 15 years I've been here. He was very, very thorough. He's the first person I've heard talk about actually doing something for Hampton. 
<coughs> and I have been very supportive of some of the other Congress people we've had, but he looks like a bright star to me, and mm. he was wonderful. It's good. Yeah, he's it's good. And I was very pleased to be there. I thought I, I was. <coughs> I didn't. I wondered why there were so few people there, but I figured it was because of the weather. Mm. But no, even though it must have been a, um, a major effort for all of the people that came from the University of New Hampshire yep. and from the Concord area mm -hmm. and from further even than that, that came there, I, I, it was very impressive. And it yeah. was a great meeting. He's a good man. Yeah. He is. Hi, right, Louise. <coughs> you have anything for the town manager's report? Nope. Jim? No. The only question I had is, you talked about the trees on Academy Ave. And yes. And yes, they need to probably come down. Where do we find that money in the budget? That's an excellent question. I can't answer it until after tomorrow. And that's what I thought. <laughs> <you were saying. laughs> I'd like to see that if we take those trees down, that we plant some trees. Yeah, something that won't grow large and gangly right. and it will look well, nice. Well, right as we need to make sure we trim them and... Yeah. and Take proper care we of them. probably need to talk to the residents on the street after the trees come down to s after they take a look at what's there and fix the sidewalk and fix the sidewalks and ask them what they want and perhaps the trees should go on their property because by law we're allowed to do that but we still have to maintain them yeah well even if you take the trees down and plant them somewhere else yeah I think that um, you know that in 1865 they were planting trees absolutely uh, I think that's you know uh, that go, trees go a long way to helping clean the environment, mm -hmm. uh, just like the recycling does. And we're f f compared to how many trees Hampton did have, with the, all the elms trees and stuff like that that oh, used yeah. to be on Route One. Mm -hmm. They need more trees. We need more trees. Yeah. If we're going to take them down. We should plant more. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be there. And if you don't have the money, then figure you know let's start some type of a memorial fund where people yeah. plant a tree and can uh, be recognized yep. in some way yeah. or remembered in some way. Yep. You want to breathe, you got to have trees. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's a good thing. But again, it all gets back to where we end up after tomorrow. Uh, so that would be a beginning point. Whether it's sidewalks or trees yep. or whatever. Yep. I mean, yep. uh, if we don't get the money for the budget, we don't get the money for the sidewalks. If we don't get the money, we can't do it. That's so. correct. Okay. Uh, all right. Old business. <coughs> DNCI Joint Operations Plan. Mr. Chairman, I, I spent some time uh, since our last meeting uh, going over the 2016-2017 mm -hmm. uh, JOP yeah. uh, with the state, the state parks. And what I did was I took the 2017 plan that we had proposed to them. I changed the dates. I went through and cleaned things up a little bit. Uh, it, it currently consists of what we are currently doing together. Even though we did not sign the plan, we've been working with it uh, and, and it has been somewhat successful uh, we, with the exception of some of the recycling problems that we've had. Uh, so I pro I'm proposing to the board for your consideration uh, at least the beginning of the process to send this to, to, the, to the state for their review to determine whether or not they would like to live with this or they'd like to make additions to it or subtractions from it. Because we really need to start negotiating that so that we have some mm -hmm. point we, of reference. Did we speak in here about the possibility of putting the roll-offs at the... We did not. And in fact, uh, I had a meeting on that today. Uh, and we're looking at some alternate plans that may just eliminate the roll-offs altogether. Uh, mm -hmm. If that works and they can just if that can be done and there's no sand involved because it can be removed yeah. through certain processes, uh, which can be done by a piece of rental equipment, mm -hmm. uh, then perhaps they can just bring the residual material in the back of a one-ton truck and we can tip it right in the transfer station and get rid of it where it should go. Mm -hmm. What's the pleasure of the board? Do you want to send this to the... So is this what we talked about in that meeting, right? Yes, sir. In the, in the yeah. different points. This is meeting. the beginning. Okay. For them to review and make yeah. changes yep. if they want. Yeah, and for you to review and make changes well, if you'd like. I mean, we, this is a two-way street. We said we would yep. negotiate this. Yep. So yeah, I'm trying to give you a starting point. You're about the beach rakings. My, my, my biggest concern was the beach rakings, and I want to just make sure that we continue to work with them mm -hmm. and them work with us. 
on on uh, so we're not dumping them down there next to the residents down no. there on I, White's Island. The, Chris and I did have a long conversation about this today, and we thrashed things around, and we think we found a way we can uh, eliminate the problem, but still take care of the trash. Okay. Hi, boys. Yeah, I just don't want to see any state roll-offs on the public works property. No, I would. want to avoid that at all costs. If, well, if what we had proposed or are thinking about works, there won't be any roll-off boxes at all. I would, I would anywhere. Rather, and I'd rather see the roll-offs there than You're down behind the houses. You're going to throw it all in the ocean. Behind the houses on, on uh, Epping Hill. No. <laughs> so, yeah, I agree with Rusty. So I'd we'll rather see the roll-offs there rather than down on yeah. Epping Ave also. And, and we'd like or to eliminate the them all together. They're right. a pain in the neck. Yeah. Yeah. No, Obviously, if we eliminate them all together, perfect. Right. Yeah. But if we have to have them, then so. So consensus of the board is to send this off to yes yes to okay. the you want a uh, motion start the process no i think your direction is good okay. enough we okay. can do that good sewer regulations ah. Jim? <laughs> <laughs> so woke her up transfixed <laughs> And, and while Jen is coming up, Mr. Chairman, I do want to commend the Public Works Department for putting notices online very fast when the uh, collection is going to be uh, delayed or something like that with the storms, yeah, they've been et cetera. Doing a pretty good job of that. that helps. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we should just put one up every day. <laughs> yeah. We're getting there, though. We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, the sewer ordinance that I believe Fred has given you a copy for. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been a month's of work in progress. How about you? We took multiple chapters from the zoning code ordinance, went through them, pulled out the stuff that was no longer relevant, updated the construction standards, put in uh, sections on grease trap inspections and grease controls and mm -hmm. limitations Good. Uh, for one of our fog issues that we're having. Uh, it also looks to establish the industrial user permits. Uh, these are the Brazonics, the finest kinds, uh, those that are required to have the state federal permits as well as a permit through us mm -hmm. uh, because of the characteristics of their waste. Uh, we've gone through and put that all in here, um, what they're supposed to file with us, how they get their permit, the reporting requirements that they'll need. Putting that all together, uh, we then also implemented a way uh, to uh, hold people accountable. So the end of this ordinance has a user fees section. Some of it is the exact same as we did. If you needed a sewer connection permit, you came down to our office. Uh, the permit is part of this ordinance now. Uh, you come down, you fill it out, it gives you all the instructions on how to do it. Same with the disconnection permit. Uh, in January, there were fees before you um, that were taken right from that section. Uh, there was a typo in them. Uh, we have always had septage disposal fees. Uh, yeah. The increase in those fees that you approved yeah. is in here, but we updated the chart to actually match the numbers uh, that are approved. Uh, that number did go up because the cost to treat our waste has gone up. Yeah. Uh, in there as well is also the fine and penalties for those uh, that exceed their industrial permit limits uh, as a means uh, for fining, uh, as well as uh, standard waste characteristics. Yeah. So that is what's before you. Um, unfortunately, not as simple to go through and just highlight the changes like we did on the fee schedules, yeah. but more to consolidate and uh, provide an ordinance that will work for the town and the department uh, in one place. So basically, it's just a complete rewrite of what it we is. had. Yeah. Um, some of the stuff doesn't change because sewer doesn't right. change, right. but it has all been put in one place. Good. Questions of the board? Good job. Oh, excellent. Regina? Nope. I uh, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. This does bring it into compliance with both state and federal law. Good. The state has reviewed this and approved it. Yes, Excellent. we couldn't be here without the state's approval. That's right. one of the steps that we Excellent. have to do. Excellent. Jim? Rick? Thank you. It's so we need a motion to make a motion that we to accept, accept the, the ordinance. Uh, the revised yep. ordinance. Right. Or, or, so ordinance. All second, I'll second, Jim. Jim, second. All those in favor? Uh, Could I ask one thing? Can we put the new fee schedule up on the town website? Oh, sure. So sure. it That's will be on the town website, and the whole, the and the whole well, ordinance will be on well. the FPW <laughs> permit and application page. Because <laughs> okay. it will all be in one place. May I ask Jen one question while sure. she's here? 
Um, have the subcontractors for the Mill Pond Dam paid yet? Do you know? Um, our last correspondence with them, uh, them being the bond company, was asking which uh, subconsultants have reached out to them and filled out their claim paperwork. Uh, for our last meeting, it was our job to get them the bond information, a copy of the bond, and the contact, and we did that for every person that reached out to us. Only three of them personally contacted me to say they did it. Um, so I reached out to the bond company with Mark um, okay. to get an answer from them. I appreciate that. Come out and how long is it going to take? Yeah, because we don't want subcontractors fleeing if they're not, if they're no. going to have to go through a whole thing. No. No, and we've Great. been working with every well, single one that's reached much. out to us. We have reached out back. Yeah. Any other questions for Jen? I have two quick questions. On the Mack truck update, yes. Yeah. Can you? As far as the trash truck? Yeah, the Mac trash truck trucks, update. yeah. Um, truck, trash one truck, truck has been delivered. Uh, we have that in the garage. Last Friday, we were fortunate enough to have both Mac and Labrie come down uh, and provide a demo, uh, show the gentleman what the differences were between the trucks, yeah. uh, things that were new and uh, uh, great as far as cameras and arms and flippers and those type of things. And uh, like anything else, uh, it's a learning experience. Thank you, sir. You know, you buy a car, you don't realize that, right. wait, that cup holder really would be better if it were here. But then you look up and you go, wow, that sunroof is great. It's the same thing with these trucks. The guys went in it right away and like, that is awesome, that is awesome. Eh, we might want to change that, that's awesome. And that's the best way to do, you know, constructive uh, truck things. So the new truck that we have is there. Uh, we are working on paperwork. Once it gets on, paperwork is done, we will be on the road. And then the second one should be here. Oh, did you want an answer to that? No. <laughs> Pretty quick. It, 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 I'm hearing a month. Yeah. I was hearing something a little less than that. You were hearing less than that, yeah. So that's... Yeah. Right. We were told February for this truck. It was delivered in February. So we should have this one hopefully in March. In March, yeah. yeah. So they've been paid out of escrow from last year, right? Not yet. Oh, but they will be. They paid. will be. They will be paid. There will be a drawdown yeah. on last year's. There will be a drawdown on the appropriation request, uh, the cost of the vehicles, because the interest rate for the uh, mm -hmm. lease purchase was an estimate. It's going to be a little bit more. That mm -hmm. money will come out of the equipment repair okay. and, and whatever account that's called. Uh, interestingly enough, because that is the case, they are giving us. A, uh, a completely free, free ride on maintenance of the vehicles through a maintenance agreement policy for both of them. It would be those extended warranties that right. generally for, cost for us anywhere years. from five to nine thousand dollars a piece. Right. Nice. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. And may, may we also ask that after both vehicles have been delivered, et cetera, that we have a new printout of the public works vehicles. Yes. Most Thank definitely. you. And thank you for cleaning all the sidewalks off and down. Yeah. We're working on it. <laughs> One little tractor at a time. <laughs> Remember to vote tomorrow. There might be some snow. Yeah. When they give you there. a shovel, Jim, then, <laughs> then you can run. And we are trading in the last of those vehicles because the last one has, the entire hydraulic system has gone on it. And yeah. we're talking anywhere up to $10,000 to replace it or fix it so that we can use it. It's just yeah. not worth it. So we're going to get rid of that vehicle as well. Good. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Next thing is new. Anything under old? Anything else under old business? New business. Election poll attendance schedule. Well, no, no nobody Regina, wants to go. Well, Regina is not. Can't be I'll on be this outside. list. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll be there. Must I've be not got. An official I can. I can come at about nine if you can cover the early morning. Okay. And I can stay until afternoon. So one o'clock? One or later if need be, whomever okay. yeah. can get there. Rusty, I can do nine to noon in the morning and uh, six to eight at night. I'm gonna be there four to eight. Hold on. So you can be there till what you say, 11? Did you say 11 or 12? One. One? One. All right. So we get two and three to cover, basically. I'll, I'll do the two and three. Okay. In the early on. So you'll do seven and eight. I'll do seven and eight. 
and I will do uh, the two and three. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. And Regina squeaks out of that. One. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's not supposed to be that nice up tomorrow. So. Actually, it's not that nice to compared oh, to the snow. past couple of elections we've yeah. had. No snow. No they snow said 39. Yeah. So, oh, that's not better too bad. Than yeah, that's not, and it's supposed yeah. to be sunny, so just keep yeah. your face yeah. to the sun. Eight degrees different than today. Yeah. So. All right, so 180 Ashworth Ave, release of bond. One year retainage of 35.76.50. We would, we would request that you do that by both the planning board and the public works department. I'll make the motion. I'll motion. second it. Okay. All those in favor? I have something on a new business I want to bring up, though. Okay. Um, I've been tracking all our legislators except for Jan Jason Janvren left, so I appreciate that you're still here. But you can get my messages out. I've been tracking some bills for a while now, and uh, I wanted to note them tonight. Um, HB 700 relative to utility valuations. None of these might not even be anything that you guys sponsored, but since you're the reps. Uh, relative to utility valuations, I went to a subcommittee session on this last Wednesday, sadly to say this is my school project, so, you know, I'm actually doing this for fun. Um, and it will be heading to the Senate next. This should be, our, this should be on our radar. It will, it will reform the current system of taxing utility companies and Unitil and Aquarian for the Town of Hampton purposes. Also along that is SB 57, which is a Senate bill, which lowers the rate of the utility property tax and repeals the tax effective April 1st of 2023. Hmm. Um, election laws I've been following, HB 105, removes the requirement that the Secretary of State conduct post-election voter, voter registration inquiries. Hmm. This requirement appears to validate our state elections and I do not understand why repealing this requirement works for the integrity of the New Hampshire ballot box. HB 106, this, amends, this bill amends the general statutory definitions of resident or inhabitant and residence or residency to include an intent to maintain a principal place of physical presence for the indefinite future. Mm. The bill restores language removed from the law in 2018, HB 1264, signed into law by the governor in 18. HB 542, this, I think, could definitely potentially affect Hampton. Additional wetlands, grants for municipalities. And then I said, is this not already re regulated at the local level? That was one of my questions. Um, HB 232, relative to enforcement of immigration laws and the prohibition of sanctuary policies. This bill was killed by the House, not sure why. Um, HB 423, this bill allows a member of the governing body of a municipality to be a non-voting member of a town or district budget committee. So mm -hmm. I'm not really sure whether they're changing weird. that up on us means if I'm on it, do That's I not get strange. to vote anymore? Yeah. It wouldn't be a voter. SB 1 and HB 712, paid family and medical leave insurance, great idea. I know a lot of people that can use it, but where will the money come from? Um, HB 287, requiring the commission of the Department of... Oh, this is Tom Sherman's bill, which is not great. But the question I had on this is, um, this is for the chemicals, regulating them through DES to make the, the uh, level more conservative. But I know EPA came out with, and I haven't had a chance to look through it all, they have something going on, and it looks like it's going to happen over the next one, two, or three years. So I just want to make sure that that gets you know, they work in conjunction with the EPA. I think if New Hampshire wants to be conservative like Vermont and New York, it's a good idea, but I don't think we should duplicate efforts. Um, HB 682 renames the Wetlands and Shoreline Review Fund as the Water Resource Fund, and it clarifies certain application and permit fees are non-refundable, repeals the Terrain Alteration Fund, and it also adds another three million in DES fees to come from taxpayers. So these are questions I'm going to ask as part of this coastal hazardous adaptation team that I'm on. HB 186, the bill establishes a state minimum hourly range and provides for annual readjustment of the minimum wage. This bill also establishes a training wage for employees under the age of 18 years. That would drastically affect the small businesses here in Hampton, as will this last bill, HB 623 FNA, relative to business profit tax and business enterprise tax and repeals the rate reductions effective mm. 2021 that were put in place by, I think they were put in place in 16 or 17. 
So I just want to let you know some research I've done legislatively, and I wanted to bring it forth to the legislators tonight, but I'm sure they can watch it later if they want. Thank you. And really, really quickly, um, Jason, Regina mentioned to me that Seabrook is getting some kind of an uh, article together on the dredging. If you could make that available to us, I think that would be nice. Since the uh, federal government uh, hates to do dredging. <clears throat> it's going to come up. Ah. See, you knew you came for something. Well, I, I actually like to come to meetings. Um, thank you for hosting us down absolutely. there. So um, the dredging bill that was put forward by the legislators in Seabrook actually was to set up a fund for the state portion because the state has to go in and take out all the moorings uh -huh. and that's all funded under the uh, Peace Development Authority um, and the harbors, the harbor masters, okay. those sorts of folks, the ports. Uh, so the appropriation is for that. Okay. It'll be for Hampton Harbor in uh, 20, no, well this year, 2019, 2020. And uh, the following year would be for Rye. Rye hasn't been dredged in 30 years, is what we were told. So. I'm not surprised. So we, we've done that. Uh, the bill was um, favorable yeah. up until it got to finance. Finance said, we're going to hold the bill. But that's OK, because it's in the governor's budget. Nice. So uh, <laughs> very happy about that, yes. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for yeah, what absolutely. you do. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. What did you mean about Tom Sherman's bill it is not good, Regina? No, I didn't say it wasn't good. I said that I, Fred actually, I think, gave us the report that the EPA looks like they're taking more action, too. So I just want to make okay. sure that. Yeah, the, uh, that bill good. was one where the board uh, right. voted to have us go up and testify in favor of it. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it was a different bill that was coming up the next day. I talked to Senator Sherman that evening, and he indicated the bill's been re-referred in light of the uh, the DES process still right. ongoing for uh, potentially lowering the uh, PFAS levels further. So yeah. his bill is not dead, but it's been re-referred awaiting that process. Yeah. Good. Okay. Anything else on the new business? I think, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that the board should do in the relatively near future is sit and discuss with Public Works the changes that are coming in recycling. Yes. I think you're Definitely. right. After tonight's, well, that was a good one. we know that these, the uh, our current recycling provider, and we are going to be going out to bid sometime in the next year, uh, is in fact going to notify us that they will no longer accept glass, which is probably our heaviest weight for trash that yep. we have to handle. Yeah. So we need some other method to use to get rid of that material, so we're not paying for it by the ton. Mm. Well, I think if, if we, uh, even if we had one down there and people voluntarily brought it to the transfer station, a little bit would help. Well, and I think we talked to our, our beach businesses about switching over to cans. Yeah, that's true. And that's that's a tough one, but and the cans are worth substantial money if they're recycled. One of the things that I have asked Public Works to do, if we purchase the new truck that's on the warrant for tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, is to not get rid of the sander that's being replaced because we can in fact make that into a glass crusher that's, and that material I can like be used idea. for a lot of things other than just going to a landfill sure yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say we've gonna talked about it for years yeah. about yeah. using it for the roads so Good. Right. It's, we well, should start it as he explained today too they use it now under the piping as yeah. a fill. Yes. Right. And what about I mean if it's going to be buried in the ground it'll be there it's good fill. Yeah. They, they're doing that down on the cape right now because yeah. of the, such hard well, to get. Why don't we put them on for an appointment or, or for yeah. a special meeting or something yeah, to right. sit and talk? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, because there are a lot of things going on in recycling. Uh, for instance, we're allowed 5% contamination. Yeah. Our contamination represents about 20% yeah. of the amount of material we're sending down there. Yeah. And we're paying at the rate of $180 a ton for mm -hmm. that 20%. Mm. Where regular trash is only being paid for by seventy five, seventy six dollars yeah. a ton. Yeah. If we can and find we're under contract, uh, we can't change that. If we can find a way to segregate the glass, I, you know, I think right I mean, now it's, it's going it, to be it'll at, be free. It's yeah. getting people to bring it themselves. Yeah. Well, my concern or, is or that, put it in the trash. Yeah, my concern well, no, is that it's not mean. going to be segregated. It's going to go in the trash. That's what I'm saying. Which if is we going can, to jump our cost to exactly. get rid of material. If we can segregate it, can we put like? bins or something like those big bins like throughout town 
get even people if to willingly it's easier to bring it. it to us than it would to do that because we're going to have to put it in some sort of a segregated facility. We right. don't have the equipment to pick it up so individually. We'll pick it up and everything else. Right. That'll be the tough part. Because I, so. you know, it's I, it's a problem and, and, and it's it's a big problem and, and, and but it's something we're going to wrap our head around. Yes, yes. we're yes. going to do it. And the reality is, it's the bars. That's right. That's it. It's That's not where most of our homes from. with the with you're the right. Glass. Yeah. It's the bars. Yeah. I mean, right. Yeah. But you have things like I mean I have like pickle jars at home. Yeah, you know, yeah, but that's not pickle the, jar. the, the well, volume the that we're talking about. That's right. If we use it for a crushed cullet, yeah, then we can use a lot of additional material in it because it's not being recovered for new glass. Yeah, it's being recovered for construction. So yeah. you can use it for septic systems. You can use it yeah. for bedding of pipe. You can it's use free it for material, all kinds. basically. You can use it for sub basin roads. Yeah. The nice part about that is that roads and sidewalks do not heave if the sub base is made out of glass. Ah. So it, it, it represents a, a substantial investment for the town in not having to dig roads up and replace everything in them. Yeah. I'll recommend that we have a meeting, a special meeting. Excellent. Just to discuss that. Because mm -hmm. it would be I, a I late meeting. Right. right. I think right. Yeah. And then I recommend that we. Early next month. That we have a the public end of meeting, a public hearing afterwards. Yes. To yep. bring in the bar owners. Yeah, and definitely have that. Discuss it. Yeah. 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 Because we're going to have to do something. Yeah. 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 So why don't you set that up with. Will do. Chris and Jen, and then yep. we will uh, mm -hmm. we'll move forward because it, it is going to take some cooperation with the bar owners. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, all right. Do you a, will you accept a motion to adjourn? I need time. I, we need, I believe we actually a, a short for a short period. Oh, uh, sure. Have a motion under RSA 91 hyphen capital A colon 3 Roman 2 small e uh, pending claims or litigation. I'll Made by motion. Jim, seconded by. I'll second. Mary Louise, aye. all those in favor, roll aye. call. Aye, 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 aye. Thank you, Channel 22. Thank, Thank you, Max. You. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Jamvin.